Good afternoon. Welcome to the live streaming of Indocrypt 2023 recorded sessions. Prior apologies for mispronunciation, if any. The talk stream under the segment Learning with Errors are The first talk is Making the PKW Algorithm Practical for LWE by Alessandro Budroni, Ken Gyo, Thomas Johansson, Eric Martinson, and Paul Stankowski Wagner. The second talk is on a dual hybrid approach to a small secret LWE by Thomas Espitio, Antonia Jogs, and Natalia Kartenko. Hello everyone, this is Alessandro Budroni, and I'm going to present the paper Making the BKW Algorithm Practical for LWE. This is a joint work with Shanguo, Thomas Johnson, Eric Morteson, and Paul Stankowski Wagner from Lund University and University of Bergen. So I'm going to talk about the LWE problem and uh, in particular I'm going to focus on uh, the BKW algorithm that uh, solves the LWE problem. Then I will talk about uh, our contribution on this topic, I will talk about our implementation and uh, I will give the conclusions. So let's start with the LWE problem. So let m and n be two integers where m is larger or equal than n and uh, let a b be a pair such that A is a an m times n matrix where the entries are sampled uniformly at random as integers modulo q and uh, B is a vector of length m such that given S uh, a secret vector uh, of length n where the entries are sampled at random as integers modulo q and E an error vector where the entries are sampled um, uh, according to a distribution key at random that has a standard deviation sigma and the length of the vector is m then we have that b is equal to a times s plus e modulo q so the problem the search uh, learning with errors problem consists in finding s given the pair a and b why search version because there is also the decision version of the lw problem which um, consists in distinguishing such a kind of a pair lw pair from uh, another pair sampled at random um, from the same space. So given an LW instance, we can always uh, transform it unless, uh, given that we have enough samples, so M is large enough, we can always transform it um, into a new LW instance where the secret, so the new secret, uh, has the entries that are distributed in the same, according to the same distribution of the secret, of the error. Uh, this, uh, transformations, uh, this transformation runs in polynomial time and is uh, reversible. So from now on we will assume that um, the problems uh, are already transformed. The LW instances we will consider are already transformed. So why we want to study LWE? Uh, some motivation. So <clears throat> first of all it's a problem believed to be quantum resistant. It's one of the most important problems in, in uh, post-quantum cryptography. It has many cryptographic applications like fully homomorphic encryption, identity-based encryption. Um, uh, if you look at the uh, list of candidates to the um, post-quantum competitions uh, run by NIST, uh, a large number of uh, the key encapsulation methods proposed base their security on uh, LWE or on problem derived from LWE. It can be seen as generalization of LPN or um, vice versa, LPN can be, see as, can be seen as the binary case of LWE. LPN is a well-studied problem that finds applications in uh, lightweight cryptography. So, uh, there are three ways of um, attacking uh, LWE, of solving LWE. There is an algebraic approach, which is efficient only for very small noise. There is um, a lattice reduction, the lattice reduction approach, which is the, so far the most efficient in practice. So the largest uh, LW instances sold so far are sold with um, uh, lattice reduction, and it does not require a large number of samples. So this is a benefit of this approach. Then there is the combinatorial approach, which is the focus of this work, and uh, um, it uh, in general it requires a large number of samples. But I'm gonna go back on this uh, later. So when we talk about the combinatorial approach to solve the WE, we talk about the BKW algorithm. This algorithm was initially proposed to solve the LPN problem, so the binary version of uh, LWE, and then it was um, in 2015 generalized for uh, LWE. It has um, 
to, it can be divided into two phases, reduction phase and guessing phase. I'm gonna talk about um, plain BKW, which is the most basic idea uh, in this algorithm, and its reduction phase. And then I will uh, talk about more advanced techniques. So the reduction phase in plain BKW consists in um, uh, performing uh, operations between uh, the rows of the matrix uh, A, and in particular I mean uh, performing sum and subtractions between rows of the matrix A in such a way, and I'm gonna explain it uh, in details later, such that uh, after a certain number of these operations uh, we will have that um, the first, uh, say, nt entries of the matrix A have zero in their components. Uh, so the rows are, uh, of the matrix A prime uh, will have uh, zero in the first empty components and then other numbers which are different from zero. Why we want to do this? It's because uh, when uh, we multiply then A prime times S, we have that uh, a big part of the vectors S, so empty entries in particular, are different from zero. Uh, consider that uh, when we perform these operations, we perform equivalent operations also on the vector b, which becomes b prime, and also on the, uh, and as a consequence, also the vector, the error vector e gets modified and becomes e prime. Uh, as a consequence, uh, since we add errors, uh, the final vector e prime will have entries uh, that are larger compared to the initial uh, vector e. Uh, but if this is not, uh, the error is not too large, uh, we basically obtain a smaller version of the uh, LW instance where only smaller in size since uh, only a small number of uh, entries of the secrets are considered and uh, since it's smaller we can try to solve it with a guessing um, algorithm and the one used so far is based on the fast Fourier transform. And later in this talk, we will introduce a new one. So let's have a closer look on the reduction phase. So consider the first uh, d entries of each row of uh, A. And uh, what we do, we sort the samples according to these uh, d entries. In particular, we divide them into categories. And uh, we put in the same categories um, samples uh, such that they have either the same first d entries or opposite the, the first d entries. And why we do that? It's because then we can uh, perform uh, summations if they're opposite or subtraction if they are the same among these rows of A in the same category, and the resulting vector will have zero in the, in, uh, in the first d entries. There are two ways of combining, uh, of making these uh, operations. One is called LF1, which uh, preserves sample dependencies, but the number of samples decreases every time we perform this step. And then there is LF2, which um, keeps uh, the number of samples the same. It can even increase, but uh, it does not preserve sample, de sample dependencies. However, in practice, we have implemented both, but in practice we use um, LF2. Um, after performing uh, t of such kind of steps, we will have that a big number, say nt, uh, nt of uh, of this uh, of the entries of each row of A are put to zero. The error um, increases by a factor of two every time we perform a step. So for every step, the error, uh, say uh, the standard deviation. Um, uh, increases and after t steps uh, we will have the standard regression the standard de deviation uh, will be approximately 2 power t times sigma square where sigma square is the initial standard deviation uh, in, sorry initial variance um, now i'm going to introduce uh, i'm going to talk about uh, a more advanced technique which was uh, introduced uh, in 2015 uh, it's called the lazy module switch and uh, it, it can be seen as a generalization of plain BKW. So this time, instead of reducing the samples um, uh, to zero, so instead of reducing the entries of the matrix A to be zero in certain positions, uh, we reduce them uh, such that they have uh, entries that are smaller than P, factor P, modulo, uh, yeah, modulo Q. 
in absolute value. So, for example, uh, if uh, we have that p is equal to 2, then it means that we can accept entries like minus 1, 0, 1 only. Um, if uh, <coughs> p is equal to 1, then we can accept only entries equal to 0, and this is equivalent to plain BKW. So that's why we say that uh, this is um, a generalization of um, plain BKW. However, is, if p is larger than 1, uh, it takes less effort to reduce the same number of positions comp compared to plain BKW. So um, by less effort, I mean it takes a, less, a smaller number of samples are required. Uh, however, the um, reduction has lower quality and uh, as a consequence, uh, um, the final error is larger compared to plain BKW. So if the final error is given by the sum of uh, two quantities, one is the same as in plain BKW plus another quantity, and now we see what it is. So a row that is reduced using LMS will have uh, the first empty entries that are um, small. They are not necessarily zero, but they are small. And when we multiply such a vector against the vector, uh, the secret vector S, we have that uh, part of this multiplication is given by a sum of small values, because we have small values uh, uh, that are reduced by the algorithm and small values of S. And then the, the second part is given by small values uh, S and values of uh, A prime that are not small. So the, the, the sum that is indeed small, it is, uh, it goes and adds to the error. And then there is the rest. So in LMS, we again divide the samples into categories, and um, and then uh, instead of putting samples in the same category, if they have the first uh, the D entry, the first D entries uh, the same or opposite, um, we put them in such a way that when we perform the addition or subtraction, the resulting uh, vector have, has uh, small values uh, like in, in these entries. And now I can finally start with uh, our contribution to this topic. So first of all, we introduce a new reduction step. And uh, the motivation of why we did that, uh, I'm going to explain it with an example. So assume Q, the modulo is equal to 101. M is equal to 12,000, and assume we want to reduce uh, D equal to three positions. If we pick P equal to 2, then we have uh, 8,000 categories, uh, and uh, the category capacity, so how many samples fall into each category, is in average one. And it is not okay, because if we have one sample in each category, we cannot perform uh, subtraction or uh, sum between the samples, and uh, we cannot basically perform the step. So the next choice is to pick P equal to 3. The number uh, of uh, categories uh, in this case is 2744, and the category capacity is 4. So in this case, we have to pick p equal to 3. And uh, this is uh, the only choice we can make. So the, not the only, but uh, the most efficient choice. With four samples in, um, uh, in each category, we can uh, uh, obtain uh, at least four more samples. And so the overall number of um, uh, samples stays constant. However, this is the, the most efficient choice we can make, but it's not the most efficient choice possible. Because we only need three samples uh, in each category to keep the number of, um, of samples, the total number of samples constant. Uh, because from three samples we can obtain three new samples. And uh, Using uh, having three samples in each category, where the total number of uh, the category is 2744, we would need 8232 samples, and this is smaller than 12,000. So it means that uh, this means that uh, we, we made uh, the best choice we could make, but this is still not the most efficient choice. So that's why uh, we introduced. Um, Smooth LMS. In smooth LMS, we consider, we try to build the things in such a way that we use all the samples uh, we have. So we use all the resources we have. In smooth LMS, we reduce uh, the first depositions of um, 
of the samples uh, exactly as in uh, LMS and if we have more resources left we reduce uh, one additional position. Um, the difference is that this additional, additional position is less reduced uh, compared to the first D. But then in the next step, we take into consideration that this uh, position is already a little bit reduced, and uh, we make sure that after this step, uh, everything, uh, all the entries are reduced uh, in the same way. So in this way, thanks to this trick, we can uh, reduce one additional position uh, in, in one step, and uh, in practice, uh, this uh, allowed us to solve the larger LWE instances. The second uh, original contribution of this work uh, uh, is a new guessing method for the algorithm, and this, in this case is based on the fast wash Adamant transform. So what we do is the following. We multiply the system times 2 modulo q, and um, the LW equation, so we obtain from B a new vector B prime, from A a new matrix A prime, and the error becomes from E, it gets multiplied by 2, it becomes 2E. Then we reduce all the entries of A prime using, for example, smooth LMS, and we get a new vector B, B bar, A bar, which is uh, the matrix which is all reduced, times S plus 2 times E, where E is the final noise. At this point, we reduce the system modulo 2. So we get a binary system. B0 is uh, the vector, uh, the binary, uh, the least significant bits vector of um, B bar. A0 is the matrix of least significant bits of A bar. S0 is the secret, the, the, the least significant bits of the secret S. And then there is uh, E, which is uh, a binary error. So we are exactly in the case of an LPN problem. So we transform the LW problem into an LPN problem. So what is, uh, but what is in this case uh, the error E? So if we have that uh, the sum of uh, the row times the secret, given by the row times the secret, plus uh, the, uh, the error, if this sum is smaller in absolute value than q half, then the error is equal to zero. In this case, we have simply a linear system, a linear binary system, and we can use Gaussian elimination to retrieve S0. Otherwise, if the, the error is not equal to zero, and we have exactly an LPN problem. And then if the error, uh, error rate is not 50, 50, 0, or 1, then we can apply the walsh Hellman transform to recover S0 equal to S modulo 2. Uh, note that again, if we find uh, S0, then we can consider the problem broken because given S0, you can retrieve with less effort uh, the whole secret. Uh, looking at the algorithm uh, in total, uh, what we do in practice, we perform some smooth, uh, smooth plane BKW steps where uh, Play, smooth plane BKW is essentially plane BKW plus we reduce one additional position like we do in smooth LMS. Then some smooth LMS steps. Then we perform the multiplication times two modulo Q. Then more smooth LMS steps. And then we reduce the system in binary and, and we apply the fast wash element transform to retrieve the binary secret. The complexity of this algorithm is given by the sum of all these operations. And uh, the, the expression you see here is the condition uh, on uh, the samples, the number of samples to perform the algorithm. And uh, D is the, the statistical distance uh, between the final noise of the error and the uniform distribution. So in this table, we compared um, uh, the estimated complexity of our, our algorithm against uh, lattice uh, enumeration, lattice sieving, and we see that uh, when the uh, noise increases, so this parameter is alpha characterize the noise because sigma is equal to alpha times q. So when alpha increases, the noise increases, and then we see that uh, for larger noise, uh, our algorithm works better in practice than, uh, better in, in theory than um, lattice uh, sieving, lattice enumeration. Of course, we assume that uh, um, we have enough samples uh, to perform the algorithm while uh, uh, sieving uh, uh, lattice, lattice numeration, they don't require all these samples. 
Um, let's have a look of, at uh, our implementation. So we implemented uh, the algorithm. Um, we implemented BKW for LWE and we released it uh, uh, as an open source library on GitHub. It's called FBBL, uh, which stands for Fail-Based BKW for LWE. It is um, uh, it has the main characteristics of using a fail-based sample storage. So instead of um, having uh, all the samples in the in the RAM, we we write them in uh, into files. And then we use the RAM to read a chunk of them, modify them, and then write them back uh, in files. In this way, we are limited uh, in memory only by the physical memory of the machine and not by the RAM. Um, so we, since the physical memory is in general much larger, we can um, afford to handle many more samples. We implemented PlayMKW, LMS, Smooth LMS, and CodeBKW, which is another step I haven't mentioned in this talk. Uh, we support um, the two uh, guessing techniques based on uh, the fast Fourier transform and the fast wash Hanuman transform. We were able to solve relatively large LW instances, and to the best of our knowledge, this is the first uh, implementation of uh, BKW that solves uh, such large instances of um, LWE. And uh, um, we uh, supported the uh, sample amplifications. I'm going to explain what it is in a second. So, we performed two kinds of experiments. One kind is uh, we took some parameter choice and we generated our own. Uh, LWE instances with as many samples as we needed, and we try to solve them. So the numbers uh, you see here are not really indicative because uh, the focus of these experiments was to make a proof of concept that uh, the algorithm works in practice. So these numbers can definitely be improved, and there is uh, large room for uh, efficiency improvement. Uh, the second kind of experiments um, were uh, consisted in taking uh, LW instances with a limited number of samples and then um, uh, combining these samples uh, as pairs or triples uh, uh, and sum them, subtract them together to generate new samples. Uh, of course, taking into account that these new samples generated will have a larger noise. So the experiment I'm reporting here comes from um, the, the LW instance comes from one of the instances of the Tier um, Darmstadt uh, LWE challenges, and uh, where the number of samples is limited to be n square. So in this case, 1,600 samples. So we generated with sample amplifications more samples, and uh, we solved it. So this is a proof that uh, it's not necessarily true that the BKW algorithm can be applied only where a large number of samples are um, provided. So, given our conclusions, uh, we um, uh, introduced a new reduction algorithm in BKW, which is smooth LMS and is more efficient than LMS. Than LMS. Then uh, we introduced a new um, guessing technique. Um, we released our implementation as an open source library, which is available on GitHub. So, thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. My name is Natalia Harchenka. Today, I'm glad to present a revisited version of the hybrid dual lattice attack against uh, the small secret learning with errors problem. This is a joint work with my co-authors, Tamai Spito and Antoine Roux. So, let's start. Let's start by recalling what is learning with errors. The learning with errors problem was introduced by Rigev in 2005. He showed that the LWE problem is probably as hard as certain lattice problems, which implies presumable resistance against quantum attacks. Uh, he also introduced the first public key encryption scheme based on learning with errors. Since that time, many variations of the problem were introduced, like, for example, ring versions. And many other cryptographic constructions based on learning with errors have appeared. Now, together with short integer solution, learning with errors is one of the central problems in lattice-based cryptography. One of important applications of learning with errors, of learning with errors is fully homomorphic encryption schemes. 
The fastest existing fully homomorphic encryption schemes are based on the hardness of learning with errors and its reinversions. Now let's move to the definition of the problem itself. To define the learning with errors, it is useful to define the LWE distribution first. Uh, we consider the scale invariant version of the problem, so all the things that are usually defined as integers module Q are defined here as real numbers module 1, that is over the torus. Uh, we denote the real numbers module 1 as t throughout the presentation. Let s be a fixed integer vector and let c be some Gaussian-like distribution over the real numbers centered at zero. Then a sample from the LWE distribution corresponding to the secret s and the error distribution c can be obtained in the following way. First, we sample a vector a uniformly at random. As we consider scale invariant version, each coordinate of a is sampled independently from the uniform distribution over t. Then we sample the error e from our Gaussian-like xi distribution. Then we return the pair a b. Here b is the sum of the scalar product of a and the secret s plus the small error e. Now we can define the LWE problem. There are two versions. The decision version asks to distinguish the LWE distribution from the uniform distribution. The search version asks to recover the secret S given arbitrarily many samples from the LWE distribution. In this work, we consider a variation of LWE called small secret LWE. In the original definition of the LWE problem, the secret S was chosen uniformly at random from the set of all n-dimensional vectors over integers module some huge number q. In the small secret version, the secret S is sampled from the distribution with smaller entropy. For example, the secret can be a random binary or ternary vector. Many existing fully homomorphic encryption schemes based on LWE or ring LWE use small secrets. There are theoretical results proving that small secret LWE still remains a hard problem. Practically, for some parameters, small secrets can lead to more efficient attack against such schemes. Now, after recalling some basic definitions, let's move to the attacks on LWE. There exist many different attacks. Uh, the lattice attacks can be informally divided into three categories. Dual attacks, primal attacks, and reducing to unique SVP. In this work, we are developing a version of the dual lattice attack. So we start by recalling how the dual attack works. The dual lattice attack is a distinguishing attack. We are given many samples from the LWE distribution or from the uniform distribution, and the goal is to guess correctly the input distribution. Uh, here, the samples are grouped into the matrix form. Assume that we somehow have an access to a short vector V that gives us a short linear combination of the A part of the input samples. Now, consider two cases. Assume that the input samples came from the uniform distribution. Then there is nothing special about the scalar product of V times B, and it is going to behave as uniformly distributed module 1. Consider the case when the input samples came from the LWE distribution. Consider the scalar product V times B. As the samples are from the LWE distribution, it is equal to the following sum. Recall that V is chosen to be such that the linear combination V times A is a short vector. V itself is also short. E is short by the definition of LWE. Then the scalar product V times T module 1 should also be short. Thus, 
To guess the distribution of the input samples, we need to distinguish the uniform distribution over t from some concentrated around zero distribution. To sum up, the dual distinguishing attack can be divided in two steps. First, we recover an appropriate vector v. Second, we distinguish the uniform distribution from some concentrated round zero distribution. The first step, recovering an appropriate vector v, can be performed by lattice reduction. The vector v that we are searching for is a short vector in the following lattice. By finding a short vector in that lattice, we minimize both v and a times v in the same time. A basis of this lattice is given by the matrix B. Here, I n and I m are identity matrices, uh, and the lower left part is just filled in with zeros. We can find a short lattice vector by applying a lattice reduction algorithm to the basis B. To obtain short lattice vectors, blockwise lattice reduction algorithms like BKZ are usually used. BKZ works by iteratively finding the shortest vector for projected sublattices of the input lattice. The actual complexity and quality of the output of BKZ is an active research area. And in order to model its behavior, for example, to estimate complexity of lattice attack, we use the following standard assumptions. Let D be the dimension of the input lattice, and let beta be the block size of BKZ. Then we assume first that the BKZ algorithm will terminate after polynomial number of calls to the SVP oracle. Second, that the norm of the vector returned by BKZ is determined, determined by the choice of the block size beta according to the following formulas. Third, that the coordinates of the returned vector are balanced, that is, that they behave like sampled independently from the Gaussian distribution centered at zero. As we assume that the lattice reduction returns a vector with balanced coordinates, we may apply the following trick. Sometimes it can be referred as lazy modulus switching. To distinguish the LWE distribution from the uniform, recall that we need to minimize the following sum. And when S and E come from different distributions, for example, when S is much longer than E, it might be useful to rescale the lattice to make X part smaller. It can be done by adding an additional parameter Q and multiplying the top part of the lattice basis by the Q and the lower part of the basis by Q to the power minus N divided by M to preserve the volume of the lattice. This allows to vary Q and uh, balance the two parts of the sum. So that's basically all for the lattice reduction part. Now let's move to the second part of the attack. The second part consists in distinguishing the uniform distribution, module one, from some concentrated round zero distribution. The concentrated round zero distribution corresponds to the LWE input samples. It can be shown that in case of LWE input samples, under the assumptions that we make about lattice reduction, this concentrated round zero distribution is actually a modular Gaussian distribution centered at zero. So the actual goal of the second part of the attack is to distinguish the uniform distribution from the modular Gaussian. The main difficulty in distinguishing the distributions is the modulus in the modular Gaussian. In order to get rid of it, we use the Levy transform. So, in order to distinguish the distributions, we consider an estimator y, which is equal to the average of the Levy transforms of the sample. In case of the uniform distribution, as everything is symmetric, y converges to zero. In case of modular Gaussian, it can be shown that y converges to an exponent of a negative sigma squared times 2p squared. Then, to construct the distinguisher, we just need to take a large enough sample 
compute y and see whether it is closer to zero or to an exponent of uh, minus 2 p square sigma squared. The sample of size e to the power 4 p square sigma square is sufficient to distinguish the distributions with high probability. The smaller parameter sigma is, the easier it is to distinguish the distributions. Now we are ready to summarize the complexity of the dual distinguishing attack. Basically, the attack needs to call the lattice reduction n times to produce a sufficient amount of samples for distinguishing the uniform distribution from the modular Gaussian. We have a trade-off here. The more time we spend in one run of the lattice reduction, the shorter vectors we get. Shorter vectors returned by lattice reduction implies the smaller parameter of the, resu of the resulting modular Gaussian. Uh, thus, less runs of the lattice reduction are required. Now, after recalling the dual distinguishing attack, we are ready to move to our hybrid dual attack. The hybrid attack combines the lattice reduction of our projected sub with the search for some part of the secret key. That can be done in the following way. First, let's divide the secret S into two parts, S1 and S2, of dimensions N1 and N2 correspondingly. We also divide the matrix A of LWE samples in two parts such that A1 corresponds to S1 and A2 corresponds to S2. Then we can rewrite our usual LWE equation as follows. In the hybrid attack, we are going to apply the lattice reduction only to A1 part of the LWE samples matrix. We do it in the same way as we did it before in the dual attack. As before, the lattice reduction returns uh, a vector V such that the product of V with A1, S1 plus E is minimized. Then we multiply our equation by V and obtain a fresh LWE sample corresponding to S2. Now V times A2 becomes new A, V times B becomes new B, and the part that we minimize by the lattice reduction becomes a new error E. Thus, we obtain an LWE sample of smaller dimension, but with a bigger error, with a bigger noise. As the dimension of the fresh sample is smaller, we can try to recover S2 by exhaustive search. Let's see how the search part of the attack works. Assume that we have a small dimensional LWE sample as input. Let's try to guess S2. Let x be a random guess for S2. Then let's compute the difference b minus the scalar product of a and x. If our guess is correct, we obtain a small error e. Otherwise, if our guess is wrong, we'll just get something uniformly distributed. So again, the problem boils down to distinguishing the modular Gaussian distribution from the uniform. The guessing step works as follows. We compute the error E for all the candidates for all the candidates for S2 and return the candidate that produces the most concentrated around zero distribution. To do so, we need many LWE samples from the previous lattice reduction step. We combine them into the matrix A. Then we can also combine all the candidates into the matrix S2. For example, if the secret is binary, the matrix S2 is going to be a matrix of all binary vectors of dimension N2. Then the complexity of computing the arrow E for all candidates is essentially the complexity of computing the product of matrices A and S2. In the small secret case, we can perform this computation faster using the recursive structure of the source space. For example, assume that our secret is binary, that this B is only is a set of 0 and 1. The matrix of all binary vectors can be constructed recursively. We start with dimension 1, then S1 is just 0 and 1. To go to the next dimension, we just need to repeat the matrix from the previous dimension two times and add one additional row, uh, which is zeros on top of the first S1 
and ones on top of the second S1. In the general case, this recursive strategy works for any finite set B. To go to the next dimension, we just repeat the previous matrix uh, the size of the set B times and add an additional row on top of it in the same way. And this recursive structure is useful for matrix multiplication. Assume that we need to multiply a vector A and our matrix SD. Assume that we already have the result of multiplication from the previous iteration for the vector A without its first element and for the matrix S D minus 1. Then, to get A times SD, we need to repeat the result from the previous iteration K times and add to it the first row multiplied by A1. The complexity of the recursive multiplication is uh, essentially a big O of the size of the set of the search space. Now we are ready to summarize the complexity of the hybrid attack. The hybrid attack first runs the lattice reduction R times to obtain R fresh LWE samples of smaller dimension. Then for each candidate for S2, the attack computes the arrow E and chooses the candidate that produces the most narrow round zero distribution. Now the attack has two parameters that define its complexity, the lattice reduction parameter delta and the dimension of the guess N2. And note that in these settings, one run of the lattice reduction gives us one fresh LWE sample. Now let's look closer at the lattice reduction BKZ algorithm. The BKZ algorithm with block size beta works by calling an SVP oracle in dimension beta. Usually, enumeration or sieving algorithm is used as an SVP oracle. The sieving algorithm works by creating and iteratively updating a list of lattice vectors of exponential size in the dimension beta. So we may expect to get many short vectors instead of one in the end. The actual distribution of the output of seeing is not well studied, but we may assume that the number of short vectors returned by seeing is close to the size of the seeing list. Using the whole output of the seeing algorithm, we can decrease the number of times we need to run the largest reduction. Then the complexity of the hybrid attack can be re-estimated using the following formula. Here we just divide the number of runs uh, of lattice reduction by the presumable size of the signal output. Uh, now, uh, uh, after estimating the complexity of the hybrid attack, uh, we can use it to estimate the security of fully homomorphic encryption schemes, for example. So we did it, and for several schemes, we found out that our attack leads to re-estimation of the security level for some of them. Uh, for example, on this slide, we can see the security level of several updates of parameters of TFHE, which is now one of the fastest fully homomorphic encryption schemes. We see that for all the three sets of parameters, our attack gives zero bits improvement compared to the unique SVP attack that is currently used to estimate security of TFHE. So it would be interesting to compare our hybrid attack and unique SVP attack uh, on a wider range of parameters. Uh, this picture presents a comparison for the LWE parameters of dimensions from 200 to 1000 and 500, and of noise parameter ranging from 2 to the minus 10 to 2 to the minus 50. The color map shows the difference between the bit complexity of both attacks. We see that most of the time the attacks give similar results, but there are regions where one is better than another. Uh, so, for example, when noise and dimension are both big, our hybrid attack is slightly better, and for small noise, uh, USVP attack is 
more preferable. Uh, as the complexity estimation of our attack is based on several heuristic assumptions, uh, we have made some experiments to justify usage of these assumptions. Uh, first, uh, we provide a proof of concept implementation of our attack uh, that successfully works in small dimensions. Uh, second, we studied separately the output of the seeing algorithm in small dimensions from dimension 30 to 60 on random, random lattices of different volumes. For example, this picture uh, presents the distribution of lengths uh, of the vectors returned by seeing algorithm for a random lattice of dimension 50 and volume round 2 to the power 1000. Uh, we report more experimental results like this in the paper, and essentially our experiments show that the Sieving algorithm indeed produces many vectors of uh, lengths uh, very close to the expected. To sum up, uh, let's restate the key points of our hybrid do attack and stress out what's new compared to already existing do attacks. First, in this work we have revisited and refined the analysis of the dual distinguishing attack with lazy module switching, uh, which in particular includes describing an explicit algorithm for distinguishing the uniform and modular Gaussian distribution. Second, we describe the new hybrid attack uh, with efficient recursive algorithm for performing the search part. Third, uh, we propose to use the whole output of the BKZ Sieving Oracle and provide some experimental evidence to support this choice. So that's all for this talk, uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Welcome back to the pre-recorded session of Endocrypt 2020. The talk stream under the segment Functional Encryption are the first talk is Gadget Based and True Lattice Trapdoors by Nicholas Gansi and Bai Li. The second talk is Lattice Based IB with Equality Test Supporting Flexible Authorization in Standard Model by Gan Lin Duck Nguyen, Willy Susilo, Dang Hong Dong, He Kuk Lee, and Fu Chun Go. The third talk is Efficient Attribute Based Proxy Encryption with Constant Size Ciphertext by Arinjita Paul, S. Sharmila Devi Selvi, and C. Pandurangan. The fourth talk is Adaptive Secure Identity Based Inner Product Functional Encryption and its Leakage Resilience by Lingru Zhang, Zhang Wing Wang, Yu Jin Chen, C. Ming Yu. The fifth talk is CCA Secure AB Using Tag and Pair Encoding by Oliver Blazy and Sayantan Mukherjee. The sixth talk is Simpler Constructions of Asymmetric Primitives from Obfuscation by Poya Fershem, George Fishburne, and Ellen Pesilger.
Hello everyone, welcome to my section. My name is Yang Linh Đức Nguyễn. I am from Fortitary Software Development. I am here very happy to present our research to Indocrypt 2020. This year, the research about latest by IBE with equality tests, supporting flexible authorization in a standard model. This is a joint work of me with Professor Susilo, Dr. Jung, Dr. Le, and Dr. Gyo. First, in my talk, we will give an introduction to our problem and our contribution. And then we will give some background and the building blocks for our construction. And then the detailed construction will be presented. Finally, we will conclude the talk and give some future works. Let's move on to the first section, the introduction to the problem and our contribution. As you already know, an identity scheme is a public key crypto system where any string is a valid public key. In particular, email addresses and dates can be public keys. The original motivation for identity-based encryption is to help the development of a public key infrastructure. More generally, IBE can simplify systems that manage a large number of public keys. Rather than storing a bus database of public keys, the system can either write these public keys from the username or simply view the integers as a distinct public keys. The IBE system has many applications such as revoking nodes of public keys and declaration of decryption keys. Next, we will talk about equally test notion. A scheme that supports equally test notion, that means we can check the equalities of the underlying messages of two separate tests encrypted with different public keys, and it can be tested without decryption. The, the equality test notion has very nice features, such as it will support preserve the privacy because we can test without decryption. It can also compute the data statistics on the cloud database and also support matching techniques. And then, furthermore, to enhance the privacy protection, the equality test with flexible authorization allow the owner more choice in controlling what messages they want to share for certain degrees. For example, we have Taiwan. The equality test it happened between two users' own cyber tests, own of their cyber tests. And type two, the equality test between two users' specific cyber tests only. That means only one cyber test of this user and an another cyber test of another user. And type three is the much of type one and type two. The equality test happened between the specific Cybertest of this user and other user cybertest. Let's talk about the applications of IBE with equally test supporting author authorization. You can see here we have the smart healthcare and its applications. One particular application scenario can think of is assume that its family in the smart city has a smart device for monitoring their daily health, such as sleeping time, heart beat rate, how many steps a person walk a day, and so on. Their data is encrypted and stored in the cloud server, which is managed by the government. And the encrypted data can be accessed by the healthcare department from the government. It is a common request that healthcare officers need to get some resident information in order to monitor the community's health. The officers then can perform equality tests for specific keyword on encrypted data, which is stored on a cloud database here. For this scenario, we can see that the Taiwan is needed because the health officer need to do the equality tests on all the patients, on all the people in the community. And then let's consider the case in which some third-party company, such as medicine company, 
they can have the privacy if the system is only equipped with the Taiwan authorization. Suppose that the medicine company wish to know the body mass in that the IBM of the BMI of people in the community for the new kind of weight loss pill. Obviously, the, the advising company can prescribe a specific keyword related to BMI. The keyword could be a beast. And then using own any or all properties of the user in the community. Therefore, if the advertising companies are given the Taiwan methods, the company can perform equity tests on own unvaluable separate tests in the database, which is obviously not good for the resident privacy. However, it is a standard privacy policy by law that user can opt in or out for using their data. Then in this case, the type 2 and type 3 authorization will have the system to be more secure and more privacy protection for the resident in the community. Next, we will talk about the security model that we propose in our scheme. Here we have two types of security model. The, one, the first one is one-way IDCPA against the Taiwan adversary. Here, the, the, the Taiwan adversary can have the checkbox for the target and the entity, which means their goal is to review the plan test in the challenge cyber test. And the second security model is IND IDCPA. In this uh, security model, the type 2 adversary cannot have the trap door for the target identity. And their goal is to distinguish which plan test is in the trial and cyber test. Let's talk about contribution. You can see that you can see that IBE with equality test has very a uh, various widely strong applications applicable in the different domain. So there's many a lot of work involved in the IBE and also public key encryption with equality test. And our and our scheme gives the first lattice by IBE with equality test supporting plausible authorization in the standard model based on the harness of LWE problem. And you can see in the second table that the comparison of uh, the storage size in our scheme compared with, it at, with other scheme. You can see that we managed to keep the public key and the matter serial key size the same. However, in order to support the the flexible authorization, our cyber test size is increased and also the series size is increased as well. So here from this slide, we will give some fat route and wooden block for our constructions. Let's talk about the lattice. In our scheme, we will talk about the integral lattice only. Here, a lattice is a set of all integral combinations of given linearly independent vectors. This factor forms a basis for the lattice. And geometry speaking, you can see as shown in the figure, the figure shows a lattice of dimension 2 with basis B, B1 and B2. As you know, lattice based cryptography has been getting a lot of attention from the research community. This may be because of lattice based cryptography enjoys the post quantum skill and also it's easy to element among other advantages. In the lattice bay, we have some problem which can due to define the harness of the security. The first one is SIVP, which is stand for shortest and independent vector problem, which means we need to find the shortest independent vector, which is in the lattice bay, and also the gap SVB, which is find the shortest vector in the lattice bay, which equal or less than a certain number beta. 
and also for the learning good learning good error problem here we need to distinguish the two symbol the one is the inner production between a matrix a with a series x and a noisy e which the the symbol is actually uniformly random and in the paper we can prove that the SIBP and the gap SBP can reduction to LWE problem. Here, let's talk about, about the lattice trapdoor and trapdoor decoration. Then we define that a trapdoor for a matrix means that a, a short matrix TA, such as matrix A multiplied with TA equals zero mode Q. We, we have provided us the algorithm that allow us to generate a matrix A and a short matrix TA, which is a trapdoor for, for matrix A. The third net should be the richest assembly, which is research as a matrix with distribution close to Gaussian distribution. And in our scheme, we also have another algorithm, which is symbol left and symbol right. They are allowed to delegate a trapdoor for a matrix concatenation. In this, uh, in particular, you can see that we can symbol um, vector E such that the matrix, uh, the matrix F1 multiply with vector E equal ve matrix U. Here, the same is applied for symbol right algorithm. So here, let's talk about the detailed construction. Our construction follow the adaptive and entity based equation scheme in IBB 10, and you can see that the public parameter and the master series key is similar and similar to the IBE 10. Along with the setup, we can uh, we also have the extract algorithm, encrypt algorithm, and decrypt algorithm, and to support the equality test and the flexible authorization, we also have two and another algorithm. That means the TD and FAIR and the test and FAIR. We will talk about the TD and the test in the next page. Here in this slide, uh, we have the TD1 algorithm, which is, will, which is the input of the security key of the user. It will return a trapdoor and allow the receiver to able to perform the equally test on own the ID cyber test. For the TD2, it will return a trapdoor which authorize the receiver to be able to perform the equally test on the input server test only. And we also have the TD3, but it's a combination of TD1 and TD2, so we skip here. Let's talk about the test alpha. The test alpha which is alpha equal 1, 2, or 3 have the same input parameter as TDI and TDJ. And TDI and TDJ, it will perform the equality test between two separate tests with the given drop door TDI and TDJ. And the extract algorithm, in here we note that the user has the ID of ID1 to IDL. And here we compute the matrix FID as in the formula and combine with the symbol left algorithm to attract the ISI, the, the CD key for that ID. And also here we talk about the encrypt algorithm and our match tag. Here we introduce a new match tag R and build the match F with that formula. The match R has two purposes. It will it here to combine with the trapdoor for different type and file flexible operation. And it also have for the reduction from the LWE problem in the security group. Here we have an overview of our cyber tech structure. The first is the, is the matrix track R to support the flexible operation and the C1 to C4. C1 is the is the reduction. Is the, the encryption of the message M. The C3 is here to decrypt the message M. 
that is true in the encryption of the collection resistant hash function hash m. And the C4 is there to decrypt the C2 and therefore support the equality test. The C5 is in to ensure the integrity of the cyber test. And after the our detailed construction, we will talk about the, our weaknesses of our scheme. As you can see, our security model does not consider the inconsistent planet attack. So we introduce the C5 to check the inconsistence of the cyber test before executing the equality test algorithm. And also due to the security key size and cyber test size increase. So our scheme may be inapplicable in some scenario, such as in the sensor on a large way IoT devices. And here, let's move on the security roof. Our security roof is we present a series of games. Would game zero is its original of RND, IDCPA, and one way IDCPA. And in the end, we use the LWE Oracle symbol to control the matrix A in the public parameter. And then we will try to use adversaries to show the LWE problem, what is hash in certain parameter chosen. Here, here is the technique we use to do we use the matrix A in the LWE reduction. Let's recall that in LWE Oracle, we, we are given some symbol from AI and VI. Here we use them to construct the matrix A in the public parameter and also from the VI value, we construct a V star, vector V star, and use it to simulate for the challenge shepherd test especially if in particular the C3 star. And because of our target ID star, we have the airport chart and artificial chart with the half of us ID star. Here, in this case, we have us ID star equal zero, and therefore the F1 star have this formula. So in this, in this case of the LWA symbol, we have the V star equal this formula, that means it's from matrix A is transposed, multiplied with secret key, secret S1, and also with some noise Y1. And then after some man manipulation, we can see that the C3 have the same constructs of the construction of, have the same formula of in our construction. And then we can roof test our cyber test. We can simulate the challenge cyber test. Let's move on the conclusion and future works. Here, for in the conclusion, we we proud to announce that we are the first robot the lattice by IBT EET FA in the standard model. And you can see that in I in and uh, to support the possible alteration, the cyber test and the security side are increased. So in, it is an interesting future work to reduce them. And also to be able to find a stronger model for IBEET and by IBEET FA are also interesting work because to improve the security model, it also good for, for, for future. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, I'm Arinjita, and today I shall be explaining our paper, Efficient Attribute Based Proxy Encryption with Constant Size Ciphertexts. So this is the joint work done with Dr. Sharmila Deva Salvi and Professor C. Pandurangan at IIT Madras, India. So here is the organization for today's talk. First, I'll be talking about what is proxy encryption and then the need for attribute based proxy encryption or ABPRE. Then I'll be talking about the classifications and properties of ABPRE followed by its syntax and security model. 
I'll be then explaining what is collusion resistance in key policy ABPRE, the related results in this area and our contribution. After that, I'll be giving a description of our scheme and end the talk with concluding remarks. So what is proxy encryption? Proxy encryption is a cryptographic primitive which enables transformation of ciphertext under one public key to an towards another public key with the help of a third party called as proxy. So proxy re-encrypts a user Alice's ciphertext towards Bob so that Bob can decrypt it using his own secret key. So this primitive was introduced by Blaise, Blumen and Strauss in 1998 and what is important to note here is that the proxy should not learn any information about the underlying file. So the traditional proxy re-encryption primitive enables only point-to-point -point communication. Now, there are many scenarios which might require the re-encryption functionality without any knowledge of the intended recipients. So in such a scenario, uh, attribute-based proxy re-encryption comes to the rescue, which was introduced by Liang et al. in 2009 to enhance flexibility of decryption delegation power. So ABPRE integrates PRE with attribute-based encryption in which user's identity is generalized to a set of descriptive attributes. So ABPRE enables the many-to-many -many communication model and then a very important application of ABPRE is data sharing in untrusted cloud storage. So here is an example of ABPRE. Suppose Alice who has the following attributes which is to delegate her decryption rights to users who satisfy this given access structure. So as you can see, Bob who has the attributes of a cardiologist and working at general hospital satisfying this access policy will now be able to decrypt the cipher texts uh, which are initially uh, encrypted towards Alice but not Carol. So uh, in the context of attribute based encryption, ABPRE is classified into key policy ABPRE and cipher text policy ABPRE. So in key policy ABPRE, the private keys and the re-encryption keys will capture the access structures that specify what type of ciphertext the keys can decrypt or re-encrypt, while the ciphertexts are labeled with attribute sets. In case of ciphertext policy ABPRE, the user's private keys and the re-encryption keys are associated with attributes, whereas the ciphertexts are embedded with access policy information. So as you can see, uh, CP ABPRE is the dual of KP ABPRE. In this work, we will only be talking about KP ABPRE. So there are various uh, necessary properties of proxy encryption which are be needed uh, in various applications. So uh, we will be talking about two such uh, properties today. The first is uh, in the context of direction of delegation, it can be uh, categorized into unidirectional and bidirectional schemes. In unidirectional schemes, the re-encryption key will enable re-encryption of ciphertext from one access policy to the other but not in the other direction. In bidirectional schemes, the re-encryption key enables the re-encryption in both directions. Now again, based on the number of encryptions allowed, KPABPRE schemes are uh, categorized into single hop and multi hop schemes. In the single hop setting, uh, a re uh, cipher text can be re-encrypted only once. However, in the multi hop setting, a cipher text can be re-encrypted polynomial number of times. So we will be talking about single hop unidirectional KPABPRE schemes in this paper. So here is the syntax of uh, the unidirectional single hop KPABPRE schemes. So first you have a setup algorithm which is run by a certification authority CA which takes as input the security parameter kappa and the universe uh, description u and it generates the public parameters. Now we have a key generation algorithm which takes as input the public parameters, the master secret key and an access structure m row and it uh, will output a secret key corresponding to m row. Now suppose we have a sender who wishes to encrypt a file m towards uh, an attribute set w. It runs the encrypt algorithm to generate the original ciphertext or the first level encryption that is c which can be decrypted only by users uh, who's, uh, such that the attribute set w satisfies uh, the access structure uh, corresponding to the secret key of the user. So Alice who has a secret key corresponding to m row will be able to decrypt it. Now, uh, in terms of the re-encryption setting, uh, which we call as the second level encryption, the, the algorithms are as follows. First, you have a re-key generation algorithm, which is run by the delegator Alice, who is going to take as input uh, his her own secret key, that is the secret key corresponding to the access structure. It is going to take 
two access structures. One is the delegator's access uh, structure and the delegated access structure and the public parameters and it will output a re-encryption key which will enable transformation from the access structure m row towards the structure m dash row dash. Now this re-encryption key will be given as input to the proxy which will run the re-encryption algorithm by taking as input the first level ciphertext C and the public parameters and it will generate the second level ciphertext D. Note that D can be decrypted only by users who have the secret key corresponding to m dash row dash. All right, uh, and then on successfully running the algorithm uh, re-decrypt, it will uh, recover the original message m. Now what is the correctness of unidirectional single hop PRE? So it consists of the following two points. The consistency between encryption and decryption is as follows. That is for all messages in the message space, uh, all mes uh, the messages encrypted uh, towards an attribute set W which satisfies an access structure M, M row should be decryptable by the secret keys corresponding to M row. Similarly, for the consistency between the re-encryption and re-decryption algorithm, all the re-encrypted ciphertext which has been re-encrypted towards access structure M row should be decryptable by the corresponding secret key of M row. Now, uh, next I will be talking about uh, the ciphertext as, uh, the chosen ciphertext attack security for, for the uh, key policy attribute based proxy encryption schemes. So we will be talking about the security in this uh, selective setting. So this is the game based security game which is played between two entities that is the challenger and the adversary where the goal of the adversary is to break the scheme and the goal of the challenger will be to break an underlying hard problem with the solution of the adversary. So the game proceeds as follows, first you have a challenger which is going to run the setup algorithm and generate the public parameters and send it to the adversary. Now the adversary is going to uh, generate a target access structure and send to the challenger. Next it enters uh, the phase 1 or the training phase where it can generate various key generation, re-key generation, decryption or re-encryption, re-decryption uh, queries for the challenger who is going to respond accordingly. After this, the adversary is going to enter the challenge phase where it enters, uh, sends two messages M0 and M1 of its choice to the challenger. Now the challenger will pick a message uh, of its choice and an access and, a, and an attribute set W star of, uh, which satisfies the target access structure and encrypt uh, uh, the particular uh, message M psi uh, using the attribute set W star and form the challenge cipher text C star and send it to the adversary. Now the adversary enters the second training phase that is phase 2 uh, and where it can similarly query the key generation, re-key generation, decryption and re-decryption algorithm and the challenger uh, responds accordingly. Uh, there are various uh, uh, constraints which are placed on the adversary in this phase uh, depending on the security level of the game and finally the adversary is going to uh, give out its guess psi dash. So the challenger, uh, the adversary is set to win the game if it can correctly guess the message bit which was used to generate the uh, first level ciphertext and the scheme is said to be in PRE CCA secure if the advantage of the uh, adversary is negligible. We have a similar security game for the second level ciphertext security against CCA attack. So the only difference between the previous game and this game is that. In the challenge phase, the uh, ciphertext form is a second level ciphertext uh, towards uh, uh, attribute set W star which satisfies the uh, target access structure M star rho, rho star. Now consider the following scenario. So you have a delegator Alice uh, who satisfies the access structure M rho and she is going to store her second level ciphertext in the cloud. So let me remind you. The second level ciphertext in the single hub setting cannot be re-encrypted any further. Now Alice has delegated her decryption rights to an access structure m, m dash row dash which is satisfied by Bob. So Bob is a delegate in this situation. Now usually the re-encryption keys are generated in such a way that it is a function of the secret key of the delegator access structure m row, the access structure m row and uh, the access structure of the delegate m dash row dash. Okay? So as you can see. Uh, the, the cipher text D cannot be uh, uh, re-encrypted further. So the only way for Bob 
and a malicious proxy to have access to the original file encrypted as D is by acquiring the private keys of M row. Now let us consider another situation. So uh, usually the re-encryption keys are enabled for a bounded fixed period. So suppose Alice with an attribute uh, set W which satisfies M row uh, disables the re-encryption right of the proxy from M row to M dash row dash which is satisfied by Bob. So in such a case the only way for a malicious proxy and Bob to obtain the ciphertext of Alice uh, stored in the crowd uh, is by acquiring again the private keys of the access structure M row which is satisfied by Alice. So such an attack is called as collusion attack where a malicious proxy and delegative Bob with attributes W dash satisfying M dash row dash can collude to recover the secret keys of the delegator Alice with attributes W satisfying M row. And as I have already said the re-encryption key is a function of the secret key of the delegator the delegator's access structure and the delegate's access structure. All right, so it is a very natural question to ask that what if the proxy and a delegate uh, colludes? Will they be able to recover the secret key of the delegator? So it has so be seen that all the traditional proxy encryption schemes are actually vulnerable to such an attack. And such a, a disclosure actually causes total damage of Alice's privacy. It can cause unauthorized sharing of confidential files, financial loss, etc. So hence collusion resistance is a very crucial property in KP ABPRE schemes as it places minimal trust on the proxy. So here is the security model for collusion resistance. So it is again a game played between the challenger and adversary where the challenger is going to run the setup algorithm, generate the public parameters and send to the adversary. The adversary is now going to uh, generate a target access structure and send to the challenger. The adversary next enters the query phase where it can ask for the key generation and re-key generation of uh, keys of its choice to the challenger and the challenger responds accordingly. And finally the ad adversary is going to output a secret key SK and the ad adversary is supposed to win the game if the secret key SK output by it is a valid private key of the access structure M star rho star and the scheme is collusion resistant if the advers adversary is advantageous negligible. So uh, in the context of key policy ABPRE schemes, there were only three attempts made in the literature to obtain uh, uh, key policy ABPRE. So the first one was by Lee et al who gave the first construction of a CPA secure KP ABPRE scheme in the random oracle model. Their scheme uh, has uh, is uh, collusion resistant and it is secure under the DB, DB, uh, DH model sorry DBDH assumption. Next the same uh, scheme was extended in the RCCS setting by Lee et al in the random oracle model however the scheme was not collusion resistant and the scheme is again uh, proved to be secure under the DBDH assumption. Next we have another scheme by G et al which claims to be CCA secure in the standard model however it is not collusion resistant. So uh, the first two schemes I have this weakness that the re-encryption keys are generated by the PKG which makes the scheme very much uh, infeasible and uh, the, uh, the latest scheme by G et al does not adhere to the standard definition of KBPRE uh, and also in our work we show that the two schemes by Lee et al and G et al are vulnerable to RCC and CC attacks respectively. So our contribution in this work lies twofold. So first we are going to demonstrate uh, attacks on the security of two KP ABPRE schemes in the literature that is the scheme of G et al which claims to be CCA secure. We show that the scheme is vulnerable to CCA attack and also the scheme by Lee et al which claims to be RCCA secure. We, we demonstrate an RCCA attack on the scheme. Therefore we propose the first construction of a selective secure uh, CCA secure KP ABPRE scheme uh, in the random oracle model. Uh, and our scheme is proven secure under the decisional bilinear Diffie-Hellman exponent assumption and our uh, design allows uh, monotonic access structure with constant size ciphertext and our scheme is based on the KP ABPRE framework of Rao et al and BLS sort signatures. So uh, our scheme uh, enables constant size ciphertext which is highly beneficial in scenarios with low bandwidth requirements and also which has the constraint of limited computing power. 
So next I will be giving a description of our scheme. So our collusion resistant KPAB PRE schemes consist of the following algorithms. So in the setup algorithm, uh, an admissible uh, bilinear pairing E is chosen where G0 is the source group, G1 is the target group, both are of prime order P, G and G1 are generators of the source group. Uh, it is going to next pick a random exponent alpha, set it as the master secret key and it is going to compute the public value Y. The message space is uh, of the size L power L uh, M, the size of the universe space is N and for all the attributes in the uh, universe, it is going to pick uh, a, a random group element HY from the source group G0. And here are the public parameters which are generated and the hash function description I will be explaining as and when I am going to explain the scheme. Next we have a key generation algorithm which takes as input a shared generation matrix M and rho which is the access structure. The size of the matrix is L uh, times K and uh, this is again run by the certification authority CA which is going to first generate uh, execute the share algorithm to generate the shares of the secret uh, alpha. Uh, it is going to obtain L shares uh, uh, of, the, of the secret and for every row i of the matrix M it is going to pick a random element ri from zp star and it is going to com uh, compute the three key components ki, ki dash and ki double dash as shown and finally it is going to output the secret key. So as you can see a row i essentially is a mapping function which maps the rows of the matrix M to attributes. Next we have the encryption algorithm. So our encryption algorithm is based on the hashed LGML scheme uh, crypto system. Uh, so our scheme will take as input a message uh, an attribute set W and public parameters. Uh, so it will pick a random string sigma and compute the value of S and then it computes the value C0, C1, C2, C3 and C4 is essentially a BLA signature on the values W which is the attribute set uh, of the intended recipient C0, C1, C2 and C3 and it outputs uh, the uh, ciphertext, the first level ciphertext C. Uh, next we have the decryption algorithm. So this is the first level decryption algorithm uh, which will be run uh, by any users who has the secret key corresponding to M row such that W satisfies M row and first it is going to check the ciphertext validity using the BLS signature which we have generated for the component C4 and then it is going to execute the reconstruct algorithm to generate the construct uh, reconstruction shares of the secret compute the values E1, E2 and then it is going to recover the original message M as shown below. I have shown the correctness. Next we have our rekey generation algorithm. So the rekey generation algorithm will take as input the two access structures M row and M dash row dash of the delegator and delegatee respectively. It is going to choose theta randomly and two strings delta and gamma. And for every row uh, i of the delegator's access structure matrix M, it is going to compute the components Riki 1i, Riki 2i and Riki 3i as shown here. As, uh, uh, and then after that it is going to pick at random an attribute set W dash which satisfies the delegator's access structure M dash row dash. And again it is going to compute the value S dash, the components uh, of the Riki, Riki 4, Riki 5, Riki 6 and Riki 7 here is uh, a BLS signature on the components W dash and the other Riki components. So the intuition as to why our scheme is collusion resistant uh, is over here. As you can see the components in Riki 4 that is delta and gamma is blinded with random salt which can only be uh, recovered by the secret keys of uh, uh, a user satisfying the access structure M dash row dash. And also if you see the component Riki 1i uh, the secret key of the delegator that is ki can be decrypted only using the value of theta. However, the value of theta is chosen uh, solely by the delegator and here, uh, therefore it is infeasible for any other user to recover the value of theta and therefore uh, retrieve the uh, secret key value of the delegator. And this is how the re-encryption key is generated. Next we have the re-encryption algorithm. 
so uh, the intuition as to why our, uh, our cipher texts are uh, of uh, constant size is we increase the size of the reencryption key and the secret key by a value of w where w is the size of uh, the number of distinct attributes so in the re-encryption re algorithm, we will again uh, do a ciphertext validity check as per the decryption algorithm of first level ciphertext. Similarly, we will be doing a re-encryption key uh, validity check uh, using the BLS signature we just generated. We will be then executing the reconstruct algorithm uh, of the linear secret uh, 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 sharing scheme to generate the reconstruct shares of the secret. We will be computing the intermediate values RE1, RE2. Uh, and then set the um, re-encryption or the uh, re-encryption values as given here to generate the second level cipher text D. Next we have our re-decryption algorithm. So the re-decryption algorithm will take as input the second level cipher text D, the secret key uh, corresponding to uh, m row m dash row dash which is uh, of a delegate and the public parameters. Uh, so first it is going to uh, do a cipher text validity check then it is going to execute the reconstruct algorithm of the linear secret sharing scheme to generate the reconstruct shares of the secret and uh, compute the intermediate values e1 dash e2 dash and generate the, the values of delta and sigma as shown here and using the value of delta and sigma it is going to recover the original message m so this can only be done using the secret key of the corresponding uh, access structure m dash row dash of the delegate so our scheme is selective CCS secure in the random oracle model under the assumption of n decisional bilinear Diffie-Hellman exponentiation that is n dbdh uh, assumption for both the first level and the second level ciphertexts and also uh, as per the theorem by Levert and Vognod if a unidirectional single hop KPABPR scheme is CCS secure for first level ciphertext, then the scheme is collusion resistant as well. So our scheme is also collusion resistant. So for the details of the proof, please uh, refer to the archive uh, report number 20191325. So just to conclude uh, the talk, we have demonstrated CCA attack on the only existing uh, uh, KPABPRE scheme due to G et al, which claims CCA security and collusion resistant property. And we have given the first construction of a unidirectional KPABPRE scheme with constant size ciphertext. And the scheme is uh, selective CCA secure under the NDBDG assumption in the random oracle model. That's all. Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm Lin Zhu and I'm from the University of Hong Kong. So today I will talk about adaptive skill identity based inner product functional equation and its weakage resilience. Okay, so first I will show some background. Firstly, I will talk about what is functional encryption and uh, what is inner product functional encryption. And then I will show some Introduction to leakage resilient crypto and uh, the bounded retrieval model. And then I will show our results and give some technical overview. Okay, so what is functional encryption? Functional encryption was proposed to address the all or nothing problem of traditional public key encryption. Before the definition of FE appears, there were many works to overcome this problem. These works, including IBE, ABE, and PE, are considered as special cases of FE. So, in a traditional public key encryption, the key generator will generate public key and a secret key. And then we can use a public key to do the encryption to get the ciphertext. And then we can use a secret key to do the decryption to recover the message M. But in a FE scheme, the key generator will generate a public key and a master secret key. Also, we can use the public key to do the encryption to get the ciphertext. But when we want to do the decryption, we, firstly we need to choose a function f. And then we will call the key generation algorithm to generate a secret key, skf for the function. And then we can use the secret key to do the decryption to get a function value of the message. So informally, the security of FE requires that one can't, one can't get any, one can't know anything about the message M except the function value FM. 
So after proposing the definition of FE, researchers started to build FE schemes for general circuits and some very powerful functions. But these FE schemes either have bounded collusion or have to rely on very powerful but impractical and not well studied assumptions. Many attacks were identified for some constructions that are based on I.O. and multilinear maps. So recently, many works tried to build efficient schemes for specific functions from well-studied standard assumptions. And most of them studied their work from inner product, which is simple but very useful. IPFE has many applications such as computing the weighted mean, so it is important to make it more powerful and more secure. So here we develop the notion that identity-based inner product functional encryption by adding access control to IPFE. So in an IPFE scheme, the encryption algorithm will output the server test for a vector X and an identity ID. And then the consideration algorithm will output a security SKY for a vector Y and an identity ID prime. And finally, the decryption algorithm will output the inner product value only if id is equal to id prime. And now we move to wiki resilient. So in traditional security models, the security really relies on complete privacy of the secret values, such as secret case and the randomness. But actually, as the development of the side channel attacks, I have found that the adversary is possible to get some information of the secret key values by capturing the physical nature of cryptographic operations. So like resilient crypto was introduced to provide formal security guarantees, even the adversary can get some information of such secret values. The first step of achieving leakage resilience is to decide an appropriate model of what information of secrets the adversary can learn. So in this paper, we consider the bounded retrieval model. So in the BRM, the amount of information can be leaked is bounded by an external parameter, and the leakage bound can be very large. Further, it requires that the efficiencies of other parts of the scheme should be independent of, from the leakage bound. And many works propose different schemes under this model, such as many PKE and IBE schemes. So in this paper, we first focus on identity-based inner product functional encryption and propose an IBIPFE scheme from DBDH assumption. And then we consider the leakage resilience of IBIPFE and propose a leakage resilient IBIPFE scheme in the BRM. Also, our IBIPFE scheme and a security proof built on hash proof system. And in our leakage model, an adversary is allowed to get at most L bit knowledge from each secret key. We use identity based security model together with a leakage query oracle to describe its security. And any adversary any can access the leakage query oracle with some secret keys and uh, functions certain times before seeing the change cipher test. As long as for each key, the total number of bits output by the leakage query oracle is at most the leakage bound L. So we first introduce our IBIPFE scheme. Our scheme is proved at Adaptive secure under DBDH assumption. And actually, an IBIPFE scheme can be viewed as a IPFE uh, scheme for the following functions. Yes, this function. So, the identity, the IND security of IP, IP BIPFE states that the adversary who can query the secret case for a set of ID and a vector Y can't distinguish which of the change message were encrypted under the condition that for all pairs have been queried and must hold that 
if id star x0 id y is equal to f id star x1 id y. Here, id star is the chained identity and uh, x0 and x1 are the chained messages. Mm, the main difference between selective secure and adaptive secure is that in adaptive IND security game, the adversary is given the master public key at the beginning and uh, chooses the change message after the first round of security queries. But in selective IND security game, the adversary has to decide the change message before the generation of master public key and the master secret key. And also our pr security proof is simpler than the security proof in the selective case. We use the fact that the master secret key is known to the reduction at any time. Then it can deal with secret key queries without knowing the change message in advance. So now we focus on the second part of our results. Actually, many papers showed how to use a hash proof system to construct leakage resilient PKE and IBE schemes. However, such HPS can't be applied to our cases directly. The reason is that IBIPFE requires that the decryption result only reveals an inner product value of two vectors and nothing else. But the decapsulation algorithm of HPS will output the encapsulated key directly. So when using such HPS to build a FE scheme, the decryption of FE scheme will reveal the message vector other than an um, inner product value only. So in order to guarantee the security of resulting IB IPFE scheme, some modifications are needed on the underlying HPS definition. So we developed the notion that identity-based inner product hash-proof system. In an IBIP HPS scheme, the valid and invalid encapsulation algorithm will take an ident identity as input and will output a separate test and an encapsulated key. And the key generation algorithm will output a secret key for a vector Y and an identity ID prime. And finally, the decapsulation algorithm will output the inner product value between the encapsulated k and the vector y only if id is equal to id prime. This modification ensures that we can get a secure IBIPFE scheme from an IBIP HPS scheme very easily by using the encapsulated k as a one-time pipe to encrypt the message vector. So as a benefit of it, we can move our focus from leakage resilience property of IBIPFE to a leakage smoothness property of IBIPHPS, and we prove the following theorem. It says that um, given a leakage smooth IBIPHPS, we can get a IBIPFE scheme in the bounded retrieval model. Here, the leakage smoothness states that the distribution of encapsulated k dropped from an invalid separate test and the secret case is almost uniform over the k space, even if the adversary can get at most l prime based information about the secret case. So now we need to design the l prime leakage smooth IBIPHPS. Also, we have to meet the efficiency requirement of the BRM. As the first step of it, we would like to design an IBIP HPS scheme from simple assumptions without requirements of the liquid smoothness and efficiency. And then we prove the following theorem to get a liquid smooth IBIP HPS scheme. The theorem sh shows that given an Zero universal IP IP HPS scheme, we can get a L prime leakage smooth IP IP HPS scheme type two 
for arbitrarily large leakage bound L prime, and also try to meet the efficiency requirements of the BRM. Now we show that we are able to convert pi 1 into an L prime leakage smooth scheme pi 2. So here we first introduce a k size parameter m, which gives us flexibility in the size of secret k and will depend on the desired leakage bound L prime. And due to the efficiency requirement, the encapsulation will only use a small subset from 1 to m and show that the size of the subset is independent of the leakage bound. And finally, we prove the leakage smoothness by applying a variant uh, leftover hash lemma and show our scheme meets the efficiency requirements of the BRM by giving a lower bound of t, where t is uh, the size of subset, which is independent of the leakage bound. Okay, so we sum up our result in the following. We first give the definition of IB IP HPS and together with some properties and the purpose and scheme pi 1 based on our adaptive skill IB IPFE scheme. And then we show how to build a L prime leakage smooth scheme pi 2 from our scheme pi 1 for arbitrarily large L prime and also try to meet the efficiency requirements of the BRM. And finally, we developed the security definition for a leakage resilient IBIPFE scheme with leakage bound L, and uh, the definition of leakage resilient IBIPFE scheme in the BRM. Then we show how to build a leakage resilient IBIPFE scheme pi 3 in the BRM from our leakage smooth IBIPHPS scheme pi 2. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. Hello everybody, uh, this is Shayantar Mukherjee. Uh, I'm going to give a talk titled CCA Secure ABE using tag and peer encoding. This is a joint work with Professor Olivier Blazy. So uh, let's start with the definition first. Uh, predicate, a predicate function is a, a predicate is a binary function with a single bit of output. So that means uh, a predicate function given X and Y either evaluated to zero or one if it is evaluated to one, we call, we say that X and Y satisfy each other. Uh, if it is evaluated to zero, we say that X and Y do not satisfy each other. Now, uh, we, uh, to achieve this kind of uh, predicate evaluation in the encrypted domain, uh, predicate encryption was introduced. So uh, for that particular predicate, so uh, a predicate encryption is defined using four probabilistic polynomial time algorithms set up key gen encrypt and decrypt set up outputs public parameter and master secret key key gen given a key attribute outputs a secret key skx uh, encrypt takes a ciphertext attribute and a, a message and gives out uh, a ciphertext uh, now decryption decrypt takes the secret key and uh, decrypt takes a secret key and a ciphertext and outputs the message if r of x y equal to 1. That means if x and y satisfy each other, then the decryption gives back the message. If they do not satisfy each other, in that case it outputs bot, some random quantity. Now one can think of uh, uh, identity-based encryption as a probable example of this kind of uh, uh, primitive. Now in case of identity-based encryption, the encryption a message is encrypted for a particular user. Uh, now that particular user with that particular identity can only decrypt the uh, ciphertext and get back the message. Others with different identities cannot decrypt the ciphertext. So that means uh, identity based encryption is a basically uh, 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 encryption function with uh, predicate equality. Okay, if ID and ID dash are same, then one can decrypt, otherwise one cannot decrypt. So, uh, so there are several predicate encryption constructions available in the literature. So uh, a lot of them are group-based constructions. Now, uh, in case of group-based predicate encryption constructions, 
cipher text and keys are usually group elements um atrapadung and vitekwi independently observe that this group elements if we consider they are exponents uh, a very nice looking properties uh, comes up right so that uh, actually uh, takes part in the predicate encryption uh, construction so so uh, think in this manner so the, the cipher text and keys are basically group elements if we consider the uh, exponents uh, of those group, particular group elements so there are they have there has to be some structure in them and those exponents are basically called the encoding now uh, from that encoding uh, atrabadung and we independently gave compilers to give predicate encryption so that means so their works were basically twofold first they came up with encodings and then then came up with a particular compiler and used that compiler to take the encodings to predicate encryption cpsc ka predicate encryption right now uh, uh, they are work independently defined two different encodings one is called predicate encoding another is called pr encoding in case of predicate encoding uh, the uh, vitek quiz uh, vitek quiz pr predicate encoding the Uh, they can support single randomnesses in the key as well as in the cipher text uh, in case of pair encoding however they could support multiple randomnesses in the key as well as in the cipher text generation uh, both the construction both these constructions were uh, uh, composite order constructions so in uh, later work uh, later work they again independently came up with uh, um, uh, prime order variant of uh, predicate encryption from pair encoding and prime order variant of uh, predicate encryption from predicate encoding both the constructions uh, uh, were uh, proved using uh, dual system proof technique and uh, they achieved uh, ind cpa security okay uh, so uh, so following this there was another work by chen and gong in 2017 asia kit over there chen and gong generalized a series of work that started with the seminal work of jutlaroy uh, chen and gong used predicate encodings to define tags now uh, these constructions are their construction is really efficient but uh, there is a small problem that uh, we already have mentioned that uh, in the last slide that uh, predicate encoding supports only single randomnesses and pair encoding supports multiple randomnesses so uh, and moreover on top of that ambrona showed that uh, pair encoding is actually indeed stronger so a natural question one should ask one can ask is that uh, cg17 has already done uh, for predicate encoding uh, has already done uh, construction of predicate encryption uh, or attribute based encryption uh, from tags which are defined using predicate encoding can one uh, do the same for pair encoding as well like uh, can we create predicate encryption where tags are created from pair encoding so they uh, yeah so this is our primary objective uh, along with this we have another objective is that uh, uh, we mentioned in the last slide that uh, this construction whatever construction we have mentioned till time till uh, now uh, all achieved ind cpa security so uh, since we are considering this in a generic sense uh, can we create a uh, uh, cca secure attribute based encryption where tags reflect pair encoding can we do that so for that let us go into the C what are the result let us go into the uh, uh, go into the uh, description of cca security what is cca security and then uh, what are the results available in the cca security and based on that we can uh, decide whether that is a interesting problem or not so let's talk about cca security so in case of cca security adversaries are usually active and can tamper with the cipher text uh, so in cca security the decryption oracle access is given to the adversary right so since uh, cca security strong models such stronger adversaries they are usually harder to achieve and requires more attention because since they are more close to the real life scenarios so uh, there are generic ways to convert cpa secure attribute based encryption to cca secure attribute based encryption like verifiability based approaches are there but they are really inefficient uh, there are more approaches like nizk based approaches also there but that is also very inefficient uh, 
now cmp 17 in indocrif 2017 uh, chatterjee mukherjee and the pundit came up with uh, a ccs efficient ccs secure pr encoding based ab so what they did so uh, now i am going to talk about uh, cmp 17 because their construction was quite efficient they didn't introduce very heavy weight additional tools but still they could achieve ccs security and uh, we want to achieve similar ccs security uh, or rather we want to achieve ccs security in similar manner can we do that okay that is our aim so for that let's go into cmp 17 so cmp 17 is basically an extension of uh, astrapadung 16 paper so uh, let's first talk about astrapadung 16 a little then we'll go into cmp 17 so uh, firstly let me to mention here this is not a real construction of astrapadung 16 this is just simplified for presentation uh, yeah and that's it so so what is this the msk takes some uh, msk is defined using some uh, uh, the vectors uh, master public key is basically some evaluation uh, of those vectors some uh, 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 some function of those vectors the secret key is computed in this manner so this is a identity based encryption that we have mentioned here that we have presented here for simplicity so the secret key is defined using alpha which is the master secret key alpha plus w1 plus x into w2 into r uh, the bone boyen hash basically so, so cipher secret key is constructed in this manner cipher text is constructed in this manner the message is encrypted here right so this is the blinding factor so during decryption we are supposed to get back the blinding factor so that we can cancel this and get back the message now in this construction getting back uh, all uh, the blinding factor is very easy because we can pair these and these right but uh, in usual case uh, it is not that simple because there will be a lot more uh, components in the cipher text lot more components in the master public key so uh, we will just uh, for decryption we just write it in a more general term so this decryption basically is evaluated in this manner as a pairing product over there this ei basically comes from the encoding the pair encoding that is uh, uh, given actually so uh, from this equation one can take this x uh, multiplication inside and define so from skx uh, we can one can define sk hat right now uh, why we are doing this because cmp actually use this structure that is why we are also showing this because we are creating we are uh, creating ground to go into cmp directly so now the cmp construction so what did the cmp did the additional stuff what exactly cmp did i have colored it in uh, cyan so you can see that v1 and v2 they chose additionally and also they define some function of v1 and v2 in terms of a and b and their intuition is that they created the cpa secure cipher text then they created a hash of it cpa secure cipher text which is eta then they evaluated another hash on that eta using the same randomness that is used in the blinding factor okay so this is their basically construction now this c0 dash uh, is provided as a part of the ccs secure cipher text now as a uh, authentication uh, to ensure the authenticity or integrity of c0 dash they have uh, evaluated one ots also ots signature also okay so this is basically uh, their construction cmp's construction uh, now see that observe that there is one additional uh, component available c0 dash now one must have to verify c0 dash or cancel c0 dash for that they defined cmp defined something called sk tilde so earlier if you remember here uh, we were defining sk hat right uh, in terms of this sk right uh, here cmp what they did is that they first defined sk hat from sk hat they defined sk tilde and they used this sk tilde to evaluate this blinding factor okay so this is basically their work so we are gisting we are uh, the briefly the, uh, summarizing what exactly cmp did what cmp did is that suppose there is this cipher text which has l plus 1 component and the secret key has m component 
let's create a commitment of the ctcpa all the ciphertext let's uh, create a comp uh, commitment which is eta which we have computed using uh, 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 collision resistant hash function and then use this eta to evaluate a bonebojen hash and randomize it using a0 okay to define c0 dash now this c0 dash uh, ensure nobody can change the c0 dash by giving one signature on c0 dash as well okay so this is basically the idea of a, a, a chk transform so uh, but chk transform was for very simpler structure this is a much complicated structure here uh, so to, is it sufficient actually it is sufficient what they showed is that uh, uh, it is sufficient for their purpose because the, intuitively the uh, currently the idea is that so uh, if somebody changes city cpa the cpa cipher text part then eta will be changed now if eta is changed then the bonebojen hash will be independent so from there uh, the, the security argument basically follows so to, what exactly cpa 17 did the new cipher text looks like this the decryption defines something called sk tilde now sk tilde is defined using g2 component okay group group 2 components to cancel c0 dash now uh, please remember this stuff this will be required in the coming sections like uh, uh, decryption requires some extra g2 component element in the public parameter uh, now uh, our aim now is to give efficient cca secure ab where tags reflect pair encoding can we do that now in this construction in this paper we basically do that and uh, that is why uh, we are presenting this uh, so uh, so let's start from the let's start from the uh, construction of uh, uh, cg17 which gave the tag based uh, ab construction so uh, the tag based ab construction of cg17 which basically used uh, predicate encoding uh, we want to achieve uh, using pair encoding but let's start from the basic the cg17 construction and uh, we are doing cg17 we are appropriating the cg17 construction again for ib so here again we are defining to three matrices some matrices w1 w2 w0 a and the public parameter is defining in this manner the secret key is defining in this manner and the ciphertext are defining in this are defined in this manner uh, now uh, during decryption we have to uh, compute this blinding factor the blinding factor is computed can be computed if x and y are not equal uh, sorry x and y are equal right if they are not equal then this creates a random value that basically hides the uh, hides the blinding factor okay so this is the identity based encryption and uh, the chain and gong showed that uh, this construction can be proved indcpa secure construction but notice here there are no g2 component there are no g2 evaluation of w0 w1 w2 in the public parameter so uh, let's uh, so so what happens why uh, here we mentioned that uh, so we started our work from here that why there is no g2 component to understand why there is no g2 component we have to go into the security proof of cg17 now if we uh, if we see the very uh, uh, crudely if we see the security proof of cg17 what they did is that so there is this cipher text right as right so this is the cipher text they change the as to some random vector c okay by dda by mddh assumption they uh, translated this to this okay then they define they redefine w1 w0 and w2 in terms of this now notice that and this is actually crucial in their security proof they define something called gamma 1 gamma 2 to uh, construct this kind of new w1 and new w2 and new w0 and this is basically uh, necessary in their construction okay here is the problem if we give w1 in the g2 component we cannot do this okay so the proof basically fails so then here we are at the end that why exactly the so what exactly is our motivation here in this work 
so our motivation here is to construct a uh, uh, the ccs uh, sorry uh, a predicate a predicate encryption construction uh, for uh, from pair encoding like uh, cmp17 and can we create efficient ccs secure construction like cmp17 now uh, we mentioned that uh, we cannot go into details in of our construction because it is quite involved uh, we would like to request the uh, audience to please uh, take a look at our paper, but we will be informally mention our result here. So uh, the result is that we uh, we can support weaker peer encoding. Uh, this peer encoding, although this is we mentioned it to be weaker, this can support multiple randomnesses in both ciphertext and both in the secret key. So that means uh, as uh, we earlier mentioned that uh, the lack uh, the problematic aspect of predicate encoding which is it supports only single randomness in key and in the ciphertext but here we can support multiple randomnesses in key and ciphertext so we are going closer to the pair encoding based predicate encryption approach uh, however we mentioned that this pair encoding uh, is a bit weaker than standard pair encoding approach for that please uh, take a look at our paper now uh, here uh, we defined some uh, gamma defined uh, using uh, defined by some uh, gamma small gamma one to gamma n and then what we do is that we add an additional component additional group component uh, additional uh, ciphertext component which is basically evaluation of the pair encoding the in the pair encoding on the randomness and the capital gamma okay so uh, then to, uh, since this additional component is given in the ciphertext we had to modify CG17 as well to support this kind of presence of uh, C ciphertext, new component, new ciphertext component. Uh, this also calls for mod modification of security as well. And we have uh, the security is uh, quite involved, and uh, we are not going to discuss about it here. Uh, this actually gives extended CG17 with multiple randomnesses. So we are getting close with the pair encoding. Right, so the, our primary motivation is achieved. Our primary aim is achieved. Now, uh, what about CCA security? So here we mentioned that earlier we mentioned we sh when we were presenting CMP17, uh, we basically uh, took the CMP17 and presented it in a very simple manner. Uh, astonishingly, that simple manner actually works with our construction. Whatever construction, whatever extended cg17 construction we came up with that particular modification actually works with uh, that uh, sits really well that uh, with the our uh, uh, construction and uh, we add uh, b v0 v1 vectors and then we can give out this as the public parameter and uh, we define similarly to cmp17 we can uh, define this manner uh, we define the hash of uh, Cypher, CPA ciphertext uh, as eta, then uh, we use this eta to define a BB hash to construct CC, CTCCA. So this is very similar to CCA, uh, CMP paper. But the CMP paper used uh, the uh, flexibility of Atravadung's construction, like Atravadung's peer encoding based construction. However, here we can reuse the security argument of CGW15. We can modify the security argument of cgw15 and use it for our purpose so this is again our observation and uh, we show that this works and uh, this is sufficient this is in fact sufficient for our purpose and uh, we construct the efficient ccs secure attribute based encryption from tag where the tags are uh, defined using peer encoding and thank you thank you for listening uh, for any question please uh, attend my uh, uh, talk in the uh, 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 scheduled time. Thanks a lot. Hello and welcome to this talk. I'm going to talk about alternative construction of asymmetric primitives from obfuscation. This is a joint work with Georg Fussbauer and Puya Farshim, and I'm Alain Pasley. So let me start by explaining a bit this long title. So uh, we construct alternative construction in the sense that the results we prove are already known from similar assumptions, we just propose alternative way of getting these results, and we focus on asymmetric primitives, so we build in particular public key encryption, 
identity based encryption, Hive and Predicate encryption, and all our constructions are based on obfuscation. So I'm going to start by explaining what is obfuscation, and in the paper we use indistinguishability obfuscation, which is a primitive that allows to transform some circuit C into a new circuit C tilde, which is the obfuscated circuit, that is functionally equivalent to the original circuit, so this is for correctness. And the security property is that if you start with two circuits C and C prime that are functionally equivalent, then their obfuscations are computationally indistinguishable. So you might have heard that I.O. is cryptocomplete, and uh, this is something that is said often in the sense that if you have I.O., then you can build almost all crypto assuming only one-way function. So our results are uh, following this line of works proving that you can build a lot from I.O. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the story of obfuscation. So indistinguishability obfuscation was first constructed based on Multi maps in 2013, so by, with a candidate construction. And since then, the status of the existence of I.O. has been quite unclear because we have had uh, a lot of progress, but also a lot of attacks and fixes. And so it was still unclear until recently whether obfuscation exists or not. And during these years of research, still some major results came up. In particular, in 2017, uh, it was proven that assuming only LWE, we can obfuscate what we call compute and compare programs, which are programs with a function hardwired and two values y and z hardwired, such that on input x, the program checks whether f of x is equal to y, and in that case, return the hardwired value z, otherwise, it just reveals nothing. So this was a really uh, nice result, but actually, in the recent months, a uh, new construction of obfuscation came up and we have now construction of general obfuscation from relatively well-formed assumption and it's uh, likely that uh, obfuscation exists now. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm not talking uh, anymore about uh, results, positive results on obfuscation, but let's jump into the construction that we have in the paper. So the starting point of our paper is a simple PK construction that is analogous to a construction we had in a paper in 2016 and that is inspired by uh, the witness encryption-based construction of public encryption from Gargettel in 2013. So for this public encryption construction, the ingredients are the following. So we have a Lange doubling PRG and an indistinguishability obfuscator. And so just as a reminder, a PRG is just a primitive that takes as input some uniformly random strings of Lange n. And so if it's Lange doubling, it outputs a string of Lange 2 n that is computationally hard to distinguish from a random value of Lange 2 n, random string of Lange 2 n. Okay, so how do we get uh, PKE from this, uh, these two ingredients? So it's very simple. The secret key is just a PRG seed, so uniformly random string of Lange n, and the public key is the output of the PRG on this secret key, so G of SK. And so now to encrypt, you just encrypt a kind of compute and compare program that has the message and the public key hardwired, and that on input S, just check that S is a pre image of the public key for the PRG, and if th in that case, it returns the message, otherwise it doesn't reveal anything about the message. So of course, to decrypt even the, such a ciphertext, you just run the obfuscated circuit on input the secret key, and if, if the secret key matches the public key, you have g of sk equal pk, and then you get the message. So correctness is immediate, and now for NCPS security, what we want is to prove that encryption of a first message M0 is indistinguishable from an encryption of a message M1, and so to do that, we can take the obfuscated circuit was with M0 hardwired in it, and switch in this obfuscated circuit the value of pk that is hardwired to hardwired instead a uniformly random string and this is possible thanks to the security of the PRG and then if we uh, uh, take a uniformly random string uh, of range 2n with good probability, with overloading probability this will not be in the range of g and then this circuit is going to be always outputting bottom so using IO security now you can show that this obfuscated circuit is indistinguishable from uh, an obfuscated circuit that doesn't contain any information of the message about the message, but just always outputs bottom. And so now to go back to uh, to uh, a circuit that contains M1, we can just do the reverse way. And so it's easy again, assuming IO security plus PRG to to get back to the obfuscated circuit that contains M1. And so we get in CPS security very simply. So a couple of remarks on uh, this uh, public key encryption scheme. So first, I mentioned that this is kind of a compute and compare program. So in particular, this is a compute and compare program in the sense of the, of the definition I gave you before. But actually, for the LWE-based obfuscation of compute and compare program, we need the value y to which we compare f of x to be low entropy. And so in our case, 
y is the public key, which is g of sk. And so it has a high entropy uh, because it's the output of a PRG on a uniform order of string. So unfortunately, we cannot use the LWB based obfuscation uh, construction to, to do that. But we'll see that actually we can still manage to instantiate this on a, on a standard assumption. Uh, another remark is that uh, the public key being pseudo random, the scheme is very easy to prove that it achieves anonymity. I'm not going to do it, but this will be the case for all the schemes actually that we have. Okay, so as I said, even though we cannot use the LWB based obfuscation because the entropy of uh, PK is high, we can still instantiate this on a very simple assumption, which is DDH. So this is one thing we do in the paper. So basically we uh, use a DDH based um, PRG, which is the standard DDH based PRG defined as follows. And so what we achieve is building a statistical obfuscator for circuits that correspond to uh, the encryption circuit. So if that checks if you know a pre-image for this PRG of the public key, and in that case, return the message. So the main idea for this obfuscator is that instead of checking that the G of S and H of S for the input that you're feeding to the circuit is equal to the public key, so I'm denoting the public key X and Y, you can check um, a randomized linear combination of, uh, of uh, G and H. So you take random alpha and beta, and so if G of S, H of S is equal to X, Y, it implies that G, G to the alpha times H to the beta, uh, everything to the power S is equal to X alpha times Y beta. So doing this kind of, uh, of a randomized linear combination of G, H, and uh, X, Y, you can actually hide the information and you get a statistical obfuscator. And so in the end, the, obfuscation, the obfuscated circuit that we, uh, we, we get has the form defined on the, on the left side of this slide. So this is just uh, uh, four group elements. And so actually the scheme we get is very similar to uh, L gamma encryption with anonymity. So the scheme in the paper is slightly different, but this is still the overall idea of the scheme. Okay, so let's go back to the generic PKE construction and let's try to now extend this to a more advanced primitives. So the encryption circuit, I'm happy with it. I'm not going to change it, but I'm going to look at uh, the secret key and the public key. So what happens is that the secret key is a uniformly random string. So in particular, maybe we could uh, change the secret key to be the output of some PRF. So let's say uh, instead of taking it completely uniform, I'm just defining as fk of zero, where, where fk is some PRF with key k. And so now doing so, I can define a tons of other secret keys. So for instance, sk1 is fk of one, sk2 is fk of two, and still we have corresponding public keys that correspond to evaluate the PRG on these secret keys. So in some sense, now I have some uh, a uh, huge family of secret keys and public keys pair that are all linked to some master secret key, which is K, right? The, the PRF key. And so if I manage to get some master public key that allows, to, allows anyone to get the corresponding public key PKI for some index I, then I would immediately uh, get an IB scheme keeping the same encryption circuit. So this is actually what we show. So basically what happens for our, our IB construction, so the master secret key is a PRF key, so uniform random string. The master public key is some way to get these uh, PK IDs that I will come back to, to later. And so the secret key for an identity is just the PRF evaluation on the input, the, the target, the, this identity, and we key the master secret key. And so the encryption scheme, the encryption circuit is the same as before, except that we use the public key of the target identity instead of the of one, the, the single public key that existed in the PK scheme. And so the main thing that remains to do is how to, to, to get this master public key that allows us to get this public key for each identity. So this is, we, we solve it doing using, using obfuscation again. So the master public key is just an obfuscated circuit that contains the master secret key, so the PRF key. And so on input the ID, just return the public key corresponding to, to, the, to this ID. So G of M, F of MSK of ID. Okay, so again, correctness is immediate. And so for NCPA security, we can almost use the same proof as for the PKE scheme, except that you need to make sure that the, the secret key of the target identity in the proof is random, which is not the case anymore because the secret key of the target identity is some PRF evaluation. So the first thing we need to do in the proof is to puncture the PRF 
to make SKID star uniform, and then we can apply the same uh, same proof of the PK construction. So a couple of remarks again, it's still anonymous, same reason as before. And another remark is that the encryption circuit is exactly the same as before. So in particular, we could instantiate this using DDH as before, but there is one additional obfuscated circuit in the construction, which is the master public key. And this master public key is an obfuscation that performs uh, both a PRG and a PRF evaluation. And this we don't know how to get except using uh, general obfuscation so far. Okay, so let's try to generalize even further. And in particular, uh, the next target is going to be uh, high, hierarchical IB. So if, you, if I sum up the, the IB construction so far, I have a master secret key, which is a PRF key. I have identity keys that are evaluation of the PRF key, of the PRF with the master secret key as a key and input the identity. And the corresponding public key is just PRG evaluation of the secret key. And the master public key is some obfuscated circuit that makes what we want. So the question to get high is how to add levels to this uh, hierarchy. So here you have a, just a master secret key and one level of ID. So I'm going to assume uh, a simpler case. So I'm going to consider the IB construction with two identities. So you have the master secret key, which is the PRF key K, and two secret keys for each identity that are evaluation of the PRF on input zero and on input one. So let's say now I want to add a level of in the hierarchy defining the, the hide. So basically I want to add new keys that are that the user that know FK0 and FK1 can generate. So the idea now is just to view FK0 and FK1 as uniformly random string, so as new PRF keys. And so you can evaluate using these new PRF keys the PRF again. And so you can create a second layer as the first one by just evaluating the PRF with K, K0 or K1 on input 0 and 1. This gives us a new layer of secret keys, so a new layer of users that are below in the hierarchy, because if you know one of the two keys of, at the first layer, you can generate two of the keys on the, on the second layer, and you can repeat the process, and in the end what you get is a binary tree based hierarchy where each user can generate all the, the keys uh, of the user that are below him in the tree. So this corresponds actually to the GGM constraint PRF. This is actually the idea of the GGM constraint PRF. And the property of this constraint PRF is that given a node in this tree, so for instance, given K11 here, that is now in blue, then you can compute all the nodes that are in the subtree rooted in K11, so the subtree in red, but still all the things in the tree that remain black looks random to you if you know K11. So combining this uh, tree-based structure with the previous IDs for the IBE construction, what we get is a hybe where the master secret keys for the hierarchy are defined as follows. So the top level key in the tree is the master secret key. And the key for each identity correspond to a key in this tree. So the depths of the identity correspond to how uh, high the identity is in the hierarchy. And the rest of the construction still works as in the IBE case. So public key of identities correspond to the evaluation of the PRG on the secret keys of these identities. The master public key is some circuit obfuscated with the master secret key hardware in it and that allows you to get PK of IDs. And overall, this gives you a bonded hype construction. So now the good news is that we can even extend this further to get predicate encryption. So the idea is the same. So the master secret key is going to be a constraint PRF key. The master public key is going to be the obfuscated circuit that allows you to get PRG evaluation of the PRF evaluation on some attribute gamma of your choice. And so now to encrypt the message with attribute gamma, what you do is just obfuscate the circuit the same as before. So this circuit basically just makes sure that someone who runs it can get the message if and only if he knows the pre-image for the public key corresponding to the attribute gamma. And so now a secret key for some predicate P is just a constraint, P, a constraint key for the PRF that allows you to get PRF evaluation on input gamma if and only if P of gamma is equal to one. So in the end, what happens is that if you have a CPRF for all circuits, so if you use a CPRF for all circuits as a F, then what you get is predicate encryption for circuit. So I'm actually, I'm cheating a bit here. The construction is slightly more involved than that, but the, the overall idea is really that, the, the core idea is really this. Okay, so now I'm going to conclude the talk by explaining the main technical result that we achieved in the paper, which is getting unbounded HYBE. 
So first, as a reminder, the difference between bonded and unbonded hive is that in bonded hive, the length of the of any identity is bonded at setup. While in, un in unbonded hive, the length of an identity, in particular the depth of the identity in the tree-based construction I gave you, would be unbonded. So this gives us several challenges. As the first one is that we use so far circuits, and circuit cannot take unbonded inputs. So maybe a solution would be to use Turing machines that can take arbitrary large input and then use indistinguishability obfuscation for Turing machines. That's actually not what we do, and the reason is that there are even problems if we do that. In particular, there are two other problems that are related. And the first one is that when we do the proof, we need to rely on the PRF security for the key corresponding to identity star, the target identity. And so to switch this PRF evaluation to a uniformly random uh, value, we need to make sure that it comes from a PRF where the key is also uniformly random. And so basically we need to, a simple solution is to replace all the keys from the path to the root, from the root to the target identity by random values. So if we do that, unfortunately, the, the thing is that we will need to hardware all these keys from the root to the, to the target identity in the circuit to replace them by uniformly random keys. And so we will need to hardware an unbounded quantity of uniformly random keys in the circuit. And so since it's unbounded, we don't know how much the original circuit needs to be padded for the, key, for the proof to work. So there is a solution to that, which is to use what we call pebbling. So pebbling allows us to only change locally the, the path from the root to the target identity. And using pebbling, you actually need to hardware only a logarithmic number of keys where the log logarithmic number in the depth of the target identity. And so doing this strategy, you can hardware only a, a limited quantity of, uh, of, uh, of uh, information in the circuit. And so we can have the construction. But still there is a problem because when we do pe pebbling, we need to know which locations are affected by the pebbling at any time. And so to do that, we need to store the positions of the in the tree where we use the the hardwired values instead of the actual keys. And so these positions are also unbounded and that we don't know how to make them bounded. So still, since we need to hardwire these positions, we don't have enough space. Uh, we don't know how, how much space we need uh, in advance to, to make the proof work. So we actually do something different in the end. So the construction works as follows. So we get unbounded hive from obfuscation of only circuits. And so the idea is the following. So the first idea is that instead of having unbounded, uh, 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 to handle the unbounded identities, what we do is that we hash the identities. So hashing the identities fix their length. So we don't have any issue with uh, circuits uh, having to work with the unbounded uh, length inputs. And so now uh, the, the public keys corresponding to some identity is not defined as g of fk of the identity, but rather as g of fk of h, where h is the hash of the identity. So the issue with this uh, new uh, way of defining the keys is that this completely just destroys the hierarchical tree-based structure that we had before. And so now the, the question is how to make sure that someone who knows a key in the tree that is defined by the identities uh, is able to get a key for a descendant or not able to get a key for uh, some, something that is not a descendant. So to do that, we now uh, provide a new circuit, an obfuscated circuit that can make sure that if a user knows a secret key for, such, for a certain identity and can prove that is asking for a, a, the, the, the key for a descendant of his identity for which he knows a proof, then he can still get the, the, the secret key of this identity. So to do that, we use snarks. So we, we uh, ask the user to, to produce a, a snark proof, a valid proof that the identity for which is uh, asking um, uh, a new secret key is also an identity that uh, is a descendant of the, the identity that for which he knows the key. And then if so, he can get the key for this identity. So the, the, the overall construction is quite complex and the proof in particular still uses pebbling to handle the unbounded hard wiring. Um, but uh, I'm suggesting you to look at the paper if you want more details. This is actually not completely straightforward, but this, I think there are a lot of uh, nice ideas in the construction. 
So with this, I'm concluding the, the talk and uh, thank you for watching. Welcome back to the pre-recorded session of Endocrypt 2020. The talk stream under the segment Secure Multiparty Computation are the first talk is Constructive T-Secure Homomorphic Secret Sharing for Low Degree Polynomials by Kitipov Palakan, Vorapong Supakit Payasan, Nutapong Atrapadum, and Kanta Matsura. The second talk is Perfectly Secure Asynchronous MPC for General Adversaries by Ashish Chaudhary and Nikhil Pappu. The third talk is Improving the Efficiency of Optimally Resilient Statistically Secure Asynchronous Multiparty Computation by Ashish Chaudhary. And the fourth talk is High Throughput Secure MPC over Small Population Hybrid Networks by Ashish Chaudhary and Aditya Hegel. Hello, I am Kitipo Palakan from the University of Tokyo. I am going to present our work with the title Constructive T-Secure Homomorphic Secret Sharing for Low Degree Polynomials. This is a joint work with Vorapong Supakit Paisan, Natapong Atrapadung, and Kanta Masura. This is the outline of the presentation. I will start with the introduction and contributions of our work. Next, I will present the related background knowledge, including non-access structure, homomorphic secret sharing, and homomorphic encryption. After that, I will explain the proposed scheme with the idea of the proofs, possible improvements, and future works. Please see the paper for more details. What is homomorphic secret sharing? Homomorphic secret sharing is a way to outsource the computation to a set of servers by restricting some subsets of servers from learning about the secret inputs. We will consider the setting as shown in the diagram. There are input clients and each has its secret input. The input clients secretly share the inputs to the computing servers. The goal of the scheme is to let the output client learn a function of the inputs. For security, no one should know the input except its owner. Homomorphic secret sharing can be seen as a multi-party computation protocol with small number of communications. For the applications, it enables secure computation on cloud servers where inputs must be kept secret. It also enables secure machine learning where the training data and models may be sensitive. In the previous work, Lai et al. proposed homomorphic secret sharing scheme based on homomorphic encryption. However, it is only one secure. This means any subsets of servers should not collude at all, including any pairs of server, which is not a realistic situation. And moreover, in the suggested T secure scheme, where at most T servers can collude, the scheme requires solving NP hard problems and requires T square servers. In this work, we propose T secure homomorphic secret sharing scheme for low degree polynomials that does not require solving NP hard problem. And there is no number of required servers. We use the idea of secret sharing from Ito et al. To see the contributions, we will consider these four parameters, including K, the degree of the underlying homomorphic encryption scheme. M, number of servers. T, the maximum number of colluding servers allowed. And D, the maximum computable degree of homomorphic secret sharing scheme. The values K and D may be confusing. We start the construction with homomorphic encryption scheme of degree K which supports computation of polynomials degree k on ciphertext. And we built the homomorphic secret sharing scheme on top of it. So the computation degree d that the homomorphic secret sharing schemes can support should be larger than or equal to k. We consider k, m, and t as requirements of the scheme. Then the number of shares and homomorphic secret sharing degree 
are considered as results. Firstly, our scheme increased the maximum degree of Shamir's homomorphic secret sharing scheme. Comparing to the classic Shamir's scheme, which is information theoretically secure and does not based on homomorphic encryption, our scheme with homomorphic encryption has around k times increasing in the degree of the homomorphic secret sharing. The security models are both threshold T. Secondly, we add threshold structures to the work of light at all. Our work supports any value of threshold. The final degree that our scheme can compute based on degree K homomorphic encryption is shown in the bottom right. Comparing to the work of light at all, our final degree has a division of T as a trade off with security. Thirdly, we decrease the number of required servers in T secure scheme of light at all. In their work, only one setting of T secure scheme is suggested. They consider the number of servers as a result, while the other parameters are requirements. Comparing to T square servers in their work, our scheme do not have a restriction on the number of servers. Finally, it can be seen that we extend the capability of homomorphic encryption. Comparing to the setting using only homomorphic encryption, we mitigate the single point of failure by adding more servers to the scheme and also increase the computable degree at the same time. You may notice that the number of shares of our scheme seems to be large. We will discuss about it later. In the next part, I will briefly introduce the definitions of non-access structure, homomorphic secret sharing, and homomorphic encryption. Let's start with non-access set and non-access structure. Non-access set is a subset of servers that is not allowed to reconstruct the secret. The non-access structure is a set that contains all chosen non-access sets. Non-access sets are selected depend on the situation and application. Non-access structure should satisfy monotone property. This means all subsets of a non-access set is also non-access. We can also define the maximal non-access structure as all the non-access sets that are not subset of other non-access sets. These are examples of non-access structure. We will also come back to these examples again later. The first one is 42 threshold non-access structure denoted by gamma 1. There are four servers and any subset of size at most two cannot learn the secret. The maximal non-access structure of gamma 1 is gamma 1 star. In the second example, we add the set of 2, 3, 4 to gamma 1. We call it as gamma 2. The maximal non-access structure of gamma 2 is gamma 2 star. Non-access structure can be represented as a hypergraph, where each vertex represents a server and each hyperedge represents a non-access set. We will use this hypergraph representation in the proof. Continuing from the previous examples, these hypergraphs represent the maximal non-access structures gamma 1 star and gamma 2 star. The next definition is the definition of homomorphic secret sharing. We come back to this diagram again. Homomorphic secret sharing is first introduced by Boyd et al. And we will use the definition from the work of Lai et al. In the protocol, the output client first publish its public key and keep the secret key only to itself. Each input client then use the public key to generate shares of the secret input and send shares to the servers. 
After that, each server will combine the shares into one message according to the desired function and send the message to the output client. Note that servers should not communicate to each other. Finally, the output client uses the secret key to see the result. This is the definition of homomorphic secret sharing. The scheme consists of four algorithms. Key generation will be run by the output client. Then the share algorithm will be used by input clients to generate shares. Each share is sent to the corresponding servers. The evaluation algorithm will be used by the computing servers to combine the shares according to the desired function. Finally, the decoding algorithm is used by the output client to get the final result. The scheme is correct if, with high probability, the final result is equal to the case where computation is performed on the inputs. For security, let the adversary choose two different inputs and then control a non-access set. The advantage to guess the input from the shares of the non-access set should be negligible. The last definition is the definition of homomorphic encryption. The setting is quite similar to homomorphic secret sharing, but this time there is only one server. The output client first publishes its public key and keeps the secret key only to itself. Each input client encrypts its input and send to the server. After that, the server will homomorphically evaluate the ciphertext according to the desired function and send the result ciphertext to the output client. Since all inputs are encrypted, the server does not get any information of the inputs. And finally, the output client decrypts the ciphertext to see the result. This is the definition of homomorphic encryption. The scheme consists of four algorithms, including key generation algorithm, which is run by the output client, encryption algorithm run by input clients, evaluation algorithm run by computing server, and decryption algorithm run by the output client. For correctness, with high probability, decryption of the final result is equal to the case where the computation is performed on plain text. For security, the advantage of the adversary to distinguish the plain text from the cipher text must be negligible. In this work, we are interested in the homomorphic encryption scheme that supports polynomial computation with different degrees. The schemes support degree 1 polynomial, such as Elgamal or Pelia are quite efficient. When we want the scheme to support higher degree, they become more inefficient. The example of degree 2 homomorphic secret sharing scheme is the BGN scheme. And the example of schemes with degree K are the schemes of Gentry, DGHV, BV, and GSW. In the next section, I will explain the proposed scheme with the idea of the proofs and then discuss some possible improvements and future works. To make it easier to understand, let's start with this simplified example. Suppose that there are two input clients with secret inputs A and B. The goal is to let the output client learn the value A times B. We build the scheme on degree 1 homomorphic encryption and use three computing servers. If we do not want any pairs of servers to learn the input, the maximal non-access structure will be as shown on the slide. In the first step, input clients generate their shares. Inputs A and B are divided into three parts corresponding to each non-access set. The sum of shares are equal to A and B. Next, the shares are distributed where the J server gets the share A gamma and B gamma as 
ciphertext if j is in gamma. Otherwise, it gets as plain text. Now, each computing server gets six shares. Four of them are ciphertext, and two of them are plain text. Note that the ciphertext are marked with boxes. It can be seen that without secret key, combining shares from only two servers will not violate the security, while combining shares from all servers will reveal the secret inputs A and B. It's time for each server to perform local computation on the shares. The goal is to compute A times B, which is a polynomial degree 2 of inputs. The function A times B is divided into three parts, each part for each server. Server 1 will locally compute Y1 as follows. Server 2 and 3 also locally compute Y2 and Y3. Then, Y1, Y2, and Y3 are sent to the output client. After adding all shares together and then decrypt, the output client learns the value A times B. You can see that the calculation for each server and the output client only requires homomorphic encryption of degree 1. To describe our proposed scheme more formally, we improve homomorphic secret sharing scheme of Lie et al. by using homomorphic encryption and secret sharing scheme for any structure from the work of Ito et al. The way to use the idea of secret sharing for any structure is as follows. For the share algorithm, the I input clan generates shares that sum to its input Xi. Each share is corresponding to each non-access set in the maximal non-access structure. The share corresponding to non-access set gamma is given to all servers that are not in that set. And the encrypted version of the share is given to all servers in gamma. The I input clan also creates shares that sum to zero and send each share to each server. All values sent to the J server are packed in SIJ. For the evaluation algorithm, we split the function f into functions f1 to fm with these conditions. The sum of f1 to fm must be equal to f. The function fj is the sum of a function gj and shares of zero of the J server. The function gj is the sum of all monomials assigned to the J server. These monomials must be able to be computed by degree k homomorphic encryption on the J server. Each server then calculates yj and sends to the output client. For the decoding algorithm, messages from servers are summed together. The output client then decrypts the sum to see the results. For the proof of correctness, if the underlying homomorphic encryption scheme is correct, then the proposed homomorphic secret sharing scheme is also correct. The proof is quite straightforward from the way we split the function f. One challenging task in this work is to find the maximum degree of the scheme and prove that there exists at least one server that can compute each term. This is the idea of the proof. The formula for computable degree is proof using pigeonhole principle on hypergraph. As in the preliminaries, we can represent the non-access structure with hypergraph. In our setting, each hyperedge is corresponding to each ciphertext chair, and each hyperedge has degree t. To compute degree d polynomial, we consider our combinations of d ciphertext. This is equivalent to choosing d hyperedges in the graph and results in dt incidences. The calculation can be performed by degree k homomorphic encryption if there exists at least one vertex in the graph that has at most k incidences. 
From pigeonhole principle, the total incidence is at most k plus 1 times m minus 1. And finally, we have our formula. To simplify the explanation, let's consider this example. We will use degree 1 homomorphic encryption. The 4-2 threshold structure can be represented as hypergraph A. To compute degree 3 polynomial, after choosing any three hyperedges, at least one vertex must have at most k incidences. If we choose three hyperedges as in graph B and C, the yellow vertices satisfy the constraint. This is true for any combinations of three hyperedges. To compute degree 4 polynomial, we choose four hyperedges. Choosing four hyperedges as in graph D, the yellow vertex satisfy the constraint. However, for the hyperedge combination in hypergraph E, no vertices satisfy the constraint. This means some polynomial degree 4 cannot be computed. For the proof of security, if the underlying homomorphic encryption scheme is semantically secure, then the proposed homomorphic secret sharing scheme is also T-secure. In the proof, we assume that there is an adversary A that can break the security of the homomorphic secret sharing scheme. Then, we can build an adversary A prime, according to the diagram, that can break the security of the homomorphic encryption. We state the resulting properties again. Our scheme has this value of computable degree. If D and K are fixed, then M is linear in T. While in the previous work, M is quadratic in T. The number of shares is increased from M in the previous work to M choose T. But the computational complexity is the same. It can be seen that our scheme requires large number of shares but for small t, or when t is close to m, the number of shares is not that large. For other values of t, possible improvements will be discussed next. Until now, we are only interested in threshold structures. However, non-threshold structures can also be useful. Consider two following structures. The first non-access structure is a subset of the second one. Both cover 4-2 threshold structure and have same computable degree. Since the number of shares is equal to the size of the maximal non-access structure, the first one requires 6 shares while the second one requires only 4 shares. So we may use the non-threshold structure instead of the threshold one. It can be seen that we combine some hyperedges together, but we do not know which hyperedges should be combined. Some combinations decrease the computable degree of the scheme. The formula for computable degree of any non-threshold structures are also not found. However, it can be computed by this integer program. The idea is to select the smallest numbers of hyperedges, which is adjacent to each vertex more than k times. If we can understand this optimization model, we may know how to combine hyperedges. As future works, we will try to find the relationships between non-threshold structures and other parameters as shown in the previous slides. In the construction of this work, we only consider semi unnest security where each party follows the protocol correctly but may try to collude and learn the secret inputs. However, in the malicious setting, a party may deviate from the protocol arbitrarily. The input client may send different values of shares to each server. The ciphertext and plaintext may represent different values. For the server, it may send any value as the evaluation result to the output client. We will try to improve the scheme to be secure in this stronger setting. Finally, 
It is interesting to generalize this construction to other inner outer schemes. It can be seen that we use homomorphic encryption as the inner scheme and secret sharing of Ito et al. as the outer scheme. It may be possible to generalize this idea of homomorphic secret sharing construction to any combinations of inner and outer schemes. That's our other presentation. Thank you for listening.
Hello everyone, myself Ashish Chaudhary from IIIT Bangalore and I will be talking about improving the efficiency of optimally resilient statistically secure asynchronous multi-party computation. So here is the summary of the paper. In this work, we present a new protocol for asynchronous multi-party computation or AMPC. The protocol uh, provides statistical security it has the optimal resilience of t less than n over 3 where n is the number of parties involved and t is the maximum number of corruptions. Communication complexity wise, it requires the communication of order n to the power 4 times kappa bits of communication for evaluating each multiplication gate where kappa is the statistical security parameter. The previous best statistically secure AMPC protocol with optimal resilience is due to Patra et al, where the communication complexity per multiplication gate is order n to the power 5 times kappa bits. So compared to the protocol of Patra et al, we get an efficiency improvement of theta n in the communication complexity. As a new technical contribution, we present a very simple and efficient protocol for verifiable asynchronous complete secret sharing or ACSS, which is of independent interest. So secure multi-party computation or MPC as introduced by Yao in 82 is a fundamental concept in secure distributed computing. So the scenario is the following. We have a set of N mutually distrusting parties and the distrust in the system is modeled by a centralized adversary which can control a subset of these parties and there is an nary function f which takes the inputs of all the parties and say the function output is y and the goal of any secure multi-party computation protocol is the following we want to design a protocol according to which the parties would like to interact with each other such that following properties are achieved, namely the privacy of the inputs of the honest parties, correctness of the computation, independence of the inputs, which uh, informally means that adversary should not be able to base the inputs of the corrupt parties based on the inputs of the honest parties. We need guaranteed output delivery, which demands that irrespective of the behavior of the corrupt parties, the honest parties always obtain the output and the list can go on. So <clears throat> the standard way of uh, defining the security of any MPC protocol is the following. We say that an MPC protocol is secure if it has the effect of emulating what we call as a trusted third party. Namely, the protocol should have the same effect as if the parties interact with a trusted third party by giving their respective inputs to the trusted third party who computes the function output and gives back the function output to everyone. So if uh, our MPC protocol can emulate the effect of such a trusted third party, then we say that our MPC protocol is secure. So because of its central importance, the MPC problem has been widely studied in various dimensions over the last three decades. So some of the dimensions in which we can uh, uh, categorize the MPC protocols are as follows. So depending upon the type of communication, we can have either synchronous MPC protocols or asynchronous MPC protocols. Depending upon the computing power of the adversary, we either get cryptographic or computational security or unconditional security. Depending upon the type of corruption, we can have either passive corruption. Passive corruption means the corrupt parties follow the protocol instructions correctly. Or we can have malicious or Byzantine corruption where the corrupt parties can deviate from honest behavior in any arbitrary fashion. So in this work, we consider the most powerful adversarial model. Namely, we consider a communication setting which is asynchronous. We assume that the corrupt parties have uh, unbounded computing power and that's why we cannot make use of any cryptographic tools and we assume that our adversary is malicious. 
So now let me say something about the asynchronous communication model. So in the asynchronous communication model, the parties do not have a global clock. So each party has its own local clock and the parties are not synchronized by any global clock. And the communication channels among the parties can have unbounded delay. The only guarantee uh, in the asynchronous model is that if any message is sent by a party, it will be eventually delivered to the intended receiver, but it can be delayed by an arbitrary amount. And because of this, since the waiting time is not known, a receiving party does not know how long it has to wait for an expected message because we don't have the notion of upper bound on the message delays. And due to this, an inherent restriction that is imposed in the asynchronous communication model is that uh, a receiving party cannot distinguish between a slow party whose messages are delayed and a corrupt party who has not sent a message at all. Okay, that means if I consider the viewpoint of this receiver and if the message M which is which it is expecting does not arrive, then it does not know whether the sending party has sent the message or not. In general, if we consider uh, is if you consider an asynchronous protocol involving n parties and where up to t parties can be under the control of the adversary, then no receiving party can afford to receive expected messages from all the n parties because otherwise the wait may turn out to be an endless wait because there could be up to t corrupt parties who may not send the expected messages. So the best that any receiving party can do is the following. It can afford to wait to receive messages from up to n minus t parties asynchronously. And as soon as it receives communication from up to n minus t parties, it has to proceed to the next step of the protocol. But in this process, the receiving party might be ignoring messages from uh, t potentially honest parties. So, the summary is that even though asynchronous network model captures our real world network like the internet more appropriately because in internet we do not have known upper bounds on the message delivery, there are inherent restrictions imposed in the asynchronous communication model and that's why designing completely asynchronous protocols is very uh, complicated process. So the MPC problem in the asynchronous communication model was uh, introduced and studied uh, in the pioneer work of Benoit et al. in 93 and 94. And there are some inherent limitations which are imposed on any asynchronous MPC protocol. So for instance, uh, any MPC protocol suffers from the problem that it does not support input provision. What do I mean by that? It means that inputs of up to T parties may be ignored for computation. And that's why the revised goal of any asynchronous MPC protocol is to securely compute an approximation of the function F on inputs of up to N minus T parties where the inputs of the remaining T parties are ignored for the computation. And that's why the <clears throat> corresponding ideal world functionality for asynchronous MPC is the following. So now we again have the scenario that we have a set of N mutually distrusting parties. Each party has some private input and we have an N array function F. But to model the fact that any real world MPC, AMPC protocol suffers from the problem of unable to provide input provision, the trusted third party cannot wait to receive the inputs of all the end parties. Rather, it waits for a set of core parties, which I denote by this fancy set C, where the cardinality of the fancy set C is n minus t, which is actually provided by the adversary. Namely, what we are saying here is that adversary can specify to the trusted third party, the set of n minus t input providers whose input should be considered for the computation. And 
why we are giving adversary the flexibility of providing the set of n minus t input providers because as i said that in the asynchronous communication model uh, the messages can be arbitrarily date and the message schedule message scheduling is also under the control of the adversary so adversary can decide what are the set of which set of n minus t parties or input should be considered for the computation so the trusted third party once it receives the inputs of the parties in the core set it substitutes zero as the input for the remaining parties outside the core set and then it computes the value of the function f based on the inputs of the parties in the core set and input being zero for the parties in outside the core set and once it computes the function output y it can send back the output to the respective parties so the goal of any real world asynchronous mpc protocol is to emulate this uh, asynchronous trusted function trusted third party so the idea behind any unconditionally secure MPC protocol, including ours, is that of shared circuit evaluation, where we assume that the function f, which the parties want to compute, is abstracted and represented by a publicly known arithmetic circuit over some finite field. And the goal of the MPC protocol will be to evaluate each gate in a shared fashion, namely, it will be ensured that each value in the computation starting from the input values all the way to the output values remains secret shared among the parties through some linear secret sharing where the degree of sharing being is t. So assuming that we are able to do this <clears throat> because of the linearity property of secret sharing, evaluating the linear gates or the addition gates in the circuit will be non-interactive, whereas Evaluating the multiplication gates will require interaction, and that's why the focus of any MPC, generic MPC protocol uh, is to uh, ensure that how efficiently we can evaluate the multiplication gates. And that's why the communication complexity of any generic MPC protocol is typically expressed in terms of the, in terms of the amount of communication that will be required to evaluate the multiplication gates in the circuit. So here uh, are the relevant results for unconditionally secure asynchronous MPC. Uh, Beno et al. in 93 showed that if we want perfect security where all the security properties of MPC are achieved in an error-free fashion, then this is possible if and only if up to n by 4 parties are corrupt during the protocol, whereas if we want statistical security, where even though adversary is computationally unbounded, but we are willing to uh, allow a negligible error in the security properties, then we can tolerate up to n by three corruptions. So in this work, our focus is on statistically secure asynchronous MPC protocol with the optimal resilience of T less than N over 3. And these are the relevant results in terms of bit complexity or communication complexity per multiplication gate. So the work of Benor et al. gives a feasibility result because as you can see, the communication complexity per multiplication gate is tremendously high. The work of Patra et al. significantly reduced the communication complexity. In this work, we further improved the communication complexity of the AMPC protocol of Patra et al. by a factor of theta. So now let me discuss about the challenges which we face while designing any asynchronous MPC protocol with the optimal resilience of T less than N over 3. So the key primitive which is used in any unconditionally secure MPC protocol is that of n comma t some secret sharing. So some secret sharing is a well-known primitive which allows a designated dealer with some private input s to distribute shares among the n parties for his secret s such that if any t plus one or more number of shares are available then the secret can be reconstructed but if only t or less number of shares are available, then the secret cannot be reconstructed. 
And to share the secret, what the dealer can do is the following. It picks a random polynomial of degree t whose constant term is the secret which dealer wants to share. And this polynomial is evaluated at n distinct alpha values. And the ith evaluation of the polynomial is given as the share to the ith party. So this is a very standard primitive. This will work in the synchronous communication setting. But if we want to execute this primitive in the asynchronous setting, and that too uh, in a setting where that up to t parties may not follow the protocol instructions properly, then there are some inherent challenges. So the first challenge is that we cannot ensure that all the end parties have actually received the shares because there can always be T parties who may not participate and get their shares. So that's why we can only get what we call as incomplete secret sharing, where only up to N minus T parties can okay, confirm that they have got their shares. But the problem that we face with this incomplete secret sharing is that later if we want to reconstruct a secret which is incompletely shared, then out of among the n minus t shareholders who have got their shares, t shareholders might further uh, be might further decide not to participate during the reconstruction. And at the time of reconstruction, we might be only having up to n minus two t shares available for reconstruction. So if we consider the optimal value of n equal to 3t plus 1, then n minus 2t is t plus 1. And among these t plus 1 shares, which are now coming at the time of reconstruction, there might be t shares, which could be given by the corrupt parties, which are not sufficient to do the standard error correction. And that's why we cannot use this incomplete secret sharing for performing shared circuit evaluation. So that's why we want to design what we call as asynchronous complete secret sharing. Uh, here we have a designated dealer with some private input S and we need a bunch of properties depending upon whether the dealer is honest or corrupt. If the dealer is honest, then we require that the secret S should be eventually some shared with every honest party getting its corresponding share. Whereas for corrupt dealer, we want a verifiability property. Namely, if the parties output some shares, then it implies that there is some value S star which dealer has indeed properly shared among the honest parties. More specifically, the ideal functionality for the ACSS primitive is the following. We have the dealer, which provides the sharing polynomial to the trusted third party. The trusted third party verifies whether the polynomial which dealer wants to share has degree T or not. If its degree is T, then the functionality distributes valid shares to the respective shareholders. Otherwise, it gives bought as the share to the respective shareholders. So Beno et al. gave a protocol for asynchronous complete secret sharing, but it was very complicated because it was based on a sequence of sub protocols here, starting with AICP all the way to ACSS. Patra et al. significantly uh, improved the ACSS protocol by getting rid of several sub protocols involved here. Our approach for designing ACSS is to get rid of the AWSS primitive as well from the protocol of Patra et al. So in the rest of the talk, I will be talking about incomplete secret sharing and how exactly we go from incomplete secret sharing to complete secret sharing. So in the incomplete secret sharing protocol, there is a designated dealer with some degree T polynomial, which it wants to secret share. And the protocol ensures the following. It ensures that the secret or the degree T polynomial is shared among a set of parties W whose cardinality is n minus t. That's why it is incomplete. And this set W is called as the set of primary shareholders. And this 
incomplete secret sharing is two dimensional in the sense that each primary share will be further secret shared among a set of n minus t parties. So for instance, in this case, uh, this I am demonstrating the protocol with n equal to four and t is equal to one. So in this case, the primary shareholders are the first three parties. The first primary shareholder will also possess share shares of its primary share R1 and each of those share shares which I call as secondary share. So R11, R13, R14 are the secondary shares of R1 and each of them is shared by the respective secondary shareholder. Signed in the sense they are information theoretically secure signatures. In the same way, the second primary share is also share shared and WT is the set of corresponding secondary shareholders. Each of them has given their respective signatures on the corresponding secondary shares to the primary shareholder P2 and in the same way we have the set W3. Each of this uh, set of secondary shareholders is of cardinality N minus T. Uh, the set of secondary shareholders might be different for different primary shareholders, but the property of this incomplete secret sharing protocol will be is that if the dealer behaves honestly in the protocol by selecting the right polynomial and giving distributing the right information, then eventually all the honest parties will become primary shareholders. Namely, all the honest parties will be included in this set up. So, I am. I, I refer the readers to the paper for the description of this incomplete secret sharing protocol, assuming that we have a value which has been secret shared in an incomplete fashion. That means we have this W set and the WI sets. Imagine we have a party who is supposed to reconstruct the secret shared value. Then Again, I am demonstrating the reconstruction assuming n equal to 4 and t equal to 1. The standard way of reconstruction would have been that each primary shareholder gives its primary share to this designated party. But to identify corrupt primary shares, what we actually demand here is the following. Each primary shareholder should submit the signed share shares and the signed secondary shares and this designated party upon receiving those signed secondary shares verify the signatures and if the signatures are verified then it interpolates the secondary shares to recover the primary share this procedure of verifying the signature prevents a potentially corrupt primary shareholder to reveal an incorrect primary share because the signatures cannot be forced so the designated party who is supposed to reconstruct the polynomial can keep on doing this process till it recovers t plus one properly shined uh, primary shares. And once it gets t plus one properly signed primary shares, it can interpolate them to recover back the dealer's signed polynomial or shared polynomial. So now let us see quickly how we can go from incomplete secret sharing to complete secret sharing. Again, in this protocol, we have a designated dealer with a t-degree polynomial, which it wants to submit share verifiably. I will again demonstrate everything with n equal to four and t equal to one. The first step that dealer will do is that it will pick a random polynomial, which is a bivariate polynomial of degree t in both the variables, where the polynomial f of zero y is the polynomial which it wants to secret share and then it computes a matrix of n cross n values which are basically distinct points on this bivariate polynomial and we call the points along the ith row of this matrix as the ith row polynomial which will be of degree t and the points along the ith column column as the ith column polynomial which will be of degree t. Now, if we take the constant term of the degree t row polynomials, then it is easy to see that basically they constitute some shares of the polynomial Q, which dealer wants to secret share. So the goal of this complete secret sharing protocol will be to ensure the following. We would like the dealer to ensure that 
he has verifiably given the ith row polynomial to ith party that will ensure that ith party has obtained its corresponding share of the q polynomial for doing that we ask the dealer to distribute the column polynomials to the respective parties and the row polynomials are now secret shared through our incomplete secret sharing instances now as part of the incomplete secret sharing instances each party will receive a share of a row polynomial but once once it receives the share of the row polynomial it performs the pairwise consistency check of the received share with its corresponding column polynomial because ideally if d is honest then this condition should hold so what i am saying here is that if i consider this party then he has already obtained the second column polynomial here and as part of the sharing instances of f1x f2x f3f x4x he will be getting these points which should ideally lie on its column polynomial so that's what the second party should verify and publicly announce and the goal of the dealer will be now to find a common set of n minus t shareholders for all the n secret sharing instances say for instance if dealer finds the party 1 party 3 and party 4 to be the common shareholders who have publicly verified the pairwise consistency of the shares of the row polynomial and the column polynomial then it basically ensures that dealer has actually distributed the row and column polynomials properly as per a single bivariate polynomial and such a set v of n minus t shareholders common shareholders is bound to eventually exist so once such a set v is found pub dealer publicly announce it and then each of the row polynomials is designated reconstructed towards the respective shareholders so f1 of x will be now reconstructed towards the first shareholder f2 of x towards the second shareholder and so on so i refer to the paper for the full details so to conclude we have presented a new statistically secure ampc protocol with a better communication complexity future work will be to close the gap in the communication complexity between synchronous and asynchronous protocols. A key technique which is used in the synchronous setting to get, get better protocols is dispute control and player elimination framework, which seems to be inapplicable in the asynchronous setting. And that's why to get better protocols in the asynchronous setting, we have to come up with new techniques. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Aditya Hegde and I'll be presenting joint work with Ashish Chaudhary titled High Throughput Secure Multiparty Computation over Small Population in Hybrid Networks. Our aim is to initiate a study of concretely efficient protocols in asynchronous and partially synchronous networks. Secure multiparty computation allows a set of mutually distrusting parties to evaluate a function on their private inputs. MPC protocols are equivalent to parties using a trusted third party that receives the party's inputs, evaluates the function, and sends the output back to the parties. MPC over small population has recently gained a lot of attention since its simplicity and efficiency allows for practical application in areas like privacy-preserving machine learning and server-aided computation. In our work, we consider four parties, out of which at most one is corrupted. The corrupted party is controlled by a malicious adversary that can cause the party to crash or arbitrarily deviate from the protocol. As in most works on MPC, we assume that all parties are connected by pairwise private and authentic communication channels. Prior works mainly consider synchronous networks, where parties are synchronized by a global clock and there exists a publicly known upper bound or message delay. Thus, if a round starts at T1, and the receiver does not receive the message after t1 plus the upper bound delta, the receiver can conclude without doubt that the sender is corrupted. Asynchronous networks on the other hand don't have any synchronization. The adversary schedules the messages and can arbitrarily delay them. 
the only guarantee is that the message is eventually delivered thus a receiver can't distinguish between a delayed message and a message that hasn't been sent this means that the receiver can wait for messages from at most n minus t parties at each step since corrupted parties might not send any message Asynchronous networks are a better model for the real world because networks like the internet do not have a well defined upper bound on message delay. Synchronization is also a hard problem in the real world due to issues like clock drift. If honest parties have small channel delays, then asynchronous protocols run faster than synchronous protocols since messages from all parties are not required to proceed to the next step. However, asynchronous MPC protocols have lower fault tolerance than their synchronous counterparts. Moreover, since it's impossible to differentiate between a delayed message and an unsent message in this setting, asynchronous MPC protocols suffer from input deprivation, where inputs of up to t parties might be ignored during evaluation. Thus, only an approximation of the function can be evaluated. Hybrid networks attempt to get around the drawbacks of asynchronous networks. by having r initial synchronous rounds followed by completely asynchronous computation in this work we also assume the presence of a broadcast channel in the first r synchronous rounds our contributions include a perfectly secure mpc protocol over hybrid networks with two initial synchronous rounds which is the first protocol in this setting a cryptographically secure mpc protocol over hybrid networks with one initial synchronous round and a cryptographically secure mpc protocol over asynchronous networks our mpc protocols over hybrid networks use the optimal number of synchronous rounds our cryptographically secure mpc protocols improve upon prior works by avoiding public key cryptography and zero knowledge proofs and rely only on symmetric key cryptography all our protocols provide optimal resilience and guaranteed output delivery where honest parties receive the output irrespective of the adversary's behavior finally we also implement and benchmark our asynchronous mpc protocol we represent the function f to be evaluated as an arithmetic circuit over a finite field consisting of addition and multiplication gates we use the shared circuit evaluation approach where the value on each wire is maintained in a secret shared form in contrast to circuit gobbling techniques Shared circuit evaluation has high throughput due to a relatively lower communication complexity and is suitable for low latency networks since parties interact over a number of rounds during the protocol. We use a linear secret sharing scheme where linear combinations of the secret can be computed locally by operating on the shells. Thus, addition gates can be evaluated locally by making use of the linearity of the secret sharing scheme. On the other hand, parties will need to interact for evaluating a multiplication gate. We make use of a random and private multiplication triple, say x, y, and z, where z is x times y, for multiplying two secret shared values e and f. e and f are first padded with x and y, and the resulting shares are reconstructed. The share of the product e f can then be expressed as a linear combination of the reconstructed values and the input secret shares. This linear combination can then be computed locally. We denote this approach of multiplying two secret shares as the protocol Beaver. So given a linear secret sharing scheme, the missing ingredient for an MPC protocol is a protocol to generate random and private multiplication triples. We use the triple generation framework of Chaudhary and Patra where parties first share a random multiplication triple using a triple sharing protocol. While the triple sharing protocol guarantees that the shared triplet is indeed a multiplication triple, the underlying secrets are known to the party that shared it. We then use a randomness extraction protocol called the triple extraction protocol to extract a new multiplication triple. This new triple is guaranteed to also be random and private. We'll now discuss our perfectly secure hybrid MPC protocol and our focus will be on the construction of the triple sharing and triple extraction protocols. Patra and Ravi talk about an open problem of constructing an MPC protocol over hybrid networks with two synchronous rounds tolerating one third corruption and having access to a synchronous broadcast channel that achieves guaranteed output delivery. 
they also show that it's impossible to achieve input provision where inputs of all parties are considered for function evaluation. We make some progress in solving this problem by providing a protocol in this setting for the case of four parties and one corruption. We use the replicated secret sharing scheme, which has been used in a number of other works on MPC for small parties due to its efficiency and simplicity. A sharing of the secret S corresponds to a tuple of four random elements under the constraint that the sum of the elements is equal to the secret. These elements are distributed among the parties to make sure that the ith party does not have the element SI, ensuring that the secret is private. Moreover, every party other than the ith party has SI. It's easy to see that the sharing is linear since the secret can be multiplied by a publicly known constant C by multiplying each element of the share by C. And the sum of two secrets can be computed by adding the corresponding elements of the share. To reconstruct a secret, all parties with the element SI send it to the ith party. The ith party waits to receive two identical copies and then computes the sum of its share element and the received SI. Reconstruction is completely asynchronous since at least two of the other parties are honest and will always send the correct SI. To share a secret, we use a verifiable secret sharing with party elimination protocol with the following functionality. If an honest party sends a secret S to the trusted third party, then the trusted third party sends the replicated secret share of S to each party. However, the adversary can input up to two honest parties, upon which the trusted third party sends a set of size at most three, called the dispute set, to all parties. The dispute set is guaranteed to contain the corrupted party. In case of a corrupted dealer, the adversary can change the underlying secret, but the output is a valid replicated secret sharing if there is no dispute set. The VSS with party elimination protocol proceeds by requiring the dealer to send each party secret share in the first synchronous round. If the dealer is honest, then the share elements with the same subscript should be equal. In parallel, the parties also exchange two random pads with every other party, corresponding to each common element in their share. In the second round, the parties use the synchronous broadcast channel to broadcast masked shares. The random pads exchanged in the previous round are used to mask the shares. In case of P1 and P2 for example, P1 would broadcast its share element A3 padded with the value sent by P2 as well as the value it sent to P2. Broadcasting the masked share ensures that the privacy of the secret is preserved. Finally, parties check if the broadcasted values are consistent. Similar to P1, P2 would have broadcasted B3 masked with the value it sent to P1 as well as the pad sent by P1. Thus, if the broadcasted elements are not equal, then A3 is not equal to B3. Either one of the parties with the inconsistent broadcast is corrupted and is lying about its share or the dealer has sent an invalid secret sharing. Thus, the dispute set consists of the dealer as well as the parties with the inconsistencies. If there are no inconsistencies, then it follows that the secret sharing is valid. We use the VSS with party elimination protocol for constructing a triple sharing protocol with party elimination. The functionality we hope to achieve is that if an honest dealer sends the value x, y to the trusted third party, the trusted third party sends the shares of the triple x, y and x times y to each party. However, once again, an adversary can input at most two honest parties, upon which the dealer sends a dispute set of size at most three guaranteed to contain the corrupted party. The triple transform functionality will be repeatedly used in the triple sharing and triple extraction protocols. It essentially allows transforming random triples to correlated but random triples. The parties send their shares for 2k plus 1 triples to the trusted third party and the trusted third party outputs a possibly different set of 2k plus 1 triples such that the first element of all the triples lie on a polynomial fa of degree k, the second element of all the triples lie on a polynomial fb of degree k 
and the last element of all the triples rely on a polynomial fc of degree 2k. Evaluating the three polynomials on input i gives the ith output triple. Moreover, if the ith input triple is a multiplication triple, that is, zi is xi times yi, then the ith output triple is also a multiplication triple. This means that the polynomial fc is fa times fb if all 2k plus 1 input triples are multiplication triples. Finally, the adversary learns the ith output triple if and only if it knows the ith input triple. Chaudhary and Patra provide a completely asynchronous instantiation of the triple transform functionality in their work. We'll be using the triple transform protocol to construct a protocol for the triple sharing with party elimination functionality which was discussed previously. The dealer first samples three random pairs of values and computes their product. These triples will later be used to extract a multiplication triple that is known only to the dealer. All parties also sample a random multiplication triple that will be used for verification of the dealer's triples. The party secret share all the locally sampled values in parallel using the VSS with party elimination protocol. The two available synchronous rounds are used up by the secret sharing protocol and all further computation will be done in the asynchronous phase. If any instance of the secret sharing protocol outputs a dispute set, then the parties output the dispute set as part of the triple share protocol too and halt. Next, the dealer's multiplication triples are transformed into correlated triples using the triple transform protocol. The parties evaluate the polynomials fa, fb and fc on input 4 in secret shared form to output the triple a4, b4 and c4. This is a linear operation and can be computed locally using methods like Lagrange interpolation. Now, if the dealer is honest, then ci will correspond to the product of ai and di, but this might not be true for a corrupted dealer. We use the verification triples shared by each party to verify that the dealer's triples are indeed multiplication triples. The verification proceeds by using the ith verification triple to compute the product of ai and bi using the Beaver protocol. The resulting product c dash of i is subtracted from ci and the difference is reconstructed to check if it is zero. If it is not zero, then either the ith triple shared by the dealer or the verification triple shared by the ith party is not a multiplication triple. In this case, the parties output a dispute set consisting of the dealer and the ith party, since one of them is guaranteed to be corrupt. If the verification of all the triples shared by the dealer passes successfully, then fc is the product of fa and fb. This follows from the fact that fc is a polynomial of degree 2 and the triples of at least 3 honest parties have been used to verify the dealer's transform triples. The parties then evaluate fa, fb and fc in secret shared form on input 5 and output the resulting triple. This is guaranteed to be private since the adversary knows at most one value on the one degree polynomials fa and fb. It is also guaranteed to be a multiplication triple since fc is the product of fa and fb. Now that each party can share a verified multiplication triple using the triple sharing with party elimination protocol, we aim to extract a random and private multiplication triple and complete the triple generation protocol. The protocol is quite simple given the triple transform protocol. Three parties each share a verified multiplication triple using the triple sharing protocol. If any instance of the protocol outputs a dispute set, each party outputs the same dispute set and halts. The multiplication triples are then transformed into correlated triples using the triple transform protocol. Since all input triples are multiplication triples, the output triples are guaranteed to be multiplication triples too. We make use of the multiplicative relation of the underlying polynomials and output the secret shared evaluation of the polynomials at input 4 as a random and private multiplication triple. Secrecy follows from the fact that at most one of the three parties are corrupted and the underlying polynomials for AI and BI are degree 1 each. Now that we have a protocol for generating multiplication triples, we can piece everything together for the MPC protocol. The MPC protocol has three phases. In the triple generation phase, a number of multiplication triples are generated in parallel using the triple generation protocol. In the input phase, parties secret share their inputs using the secret sharing protocol. 
The triple generation phase and the input phase require the two synchronous rounds and are run in parallel. The triple generation phase continues to run in an asynchronous manner after the two initial synchronous rounds. If the secret sharing and triple generation protocol terminate without outputting a dispute set, then the parties can start the circuit evaluation phase. Addition gates are evaluated locally, while multiplication gates are evaluated using the Beaver protocol. Finally, the shares on the output wires are reconstructed to receive the output. An instance of the triple generation or secret sharing protocol can also output a dispute set. In this case, the party that is excluded from the dispute set is guaranteed to be honest. The remaining parties send their inputs to the honest party, which takes on the role of a trusted third party to locally compute the function and send the output back to the parties. However, since this occurs in the asynchronous phase, the trusted third party can wait for inputs of at most two parties, which leads to input deprivation. For the cryptographically secure MPC protocol over hybrid network, we make use of a symmetry key setup for pseudo-random functions, similar to prior works. The setup assigns every combination of three parties a common key, in addition to a common key across all parties. This key setup helps significantly improve the efficiency of our secret sharing protocol. To share a secret S, the dealer, say P1, samples a common element S1 with all the parties using the common key. P1, P3 and P4 then sample a common element S2, unknown to P2, using their common key. Similarly, P1, P2 and P4 sample a common element S3, unknown to P3. To send the element S4 to P2 and P3, all parties except P4 sample a random pad R using their common key. P1 then uses the synchronous broadcast channel to broadcast S4 after masking it with R. P2 and P3 then compute S4 after unmasking the broadcasted value, which then implies that all parties can compute their share of the secret. Thus, we are able to achieve a one-round synchronous verifiable secret sharing protocol using the symmetric key setup. Working in the cryptographic setting helps optimize the concrete cost of reconstruction too. When reconstructing a list of secrets, two of the parties send the list of SI elements to the ith party, while the third party needs to send only a hash of the elements. The ith party waits to receive two identical lists or for the hash of one of the lists to match that sent by the third party. Once again, reconstruction is completely asynchronous since there are two honest senders whose messages will be consistent. Using our verifiable secret sharing and reconstruction protocols, we construct a triple generation protocol in the cryptographic setting. The triple sharing protocol is similar to that in the perfectly secure setting. The dealer shares 12 plus 1 triples instead of 3 triples and the remaining parties don't need to share verification triples in this case. The dealer's triples are transformed using the triple transformation protocol. The parties sample a random value R using their common key and evaluate the underlying polynomials in secret shared form. The parties reconstruct the shares and check if FC of R is equal to the product of FA of R and FB of R. If this check holds, then the triples shared by the dealer are indeed multiplication triples with high probability. If the check passes, we evaluate the polynomials on L inputs in secret shared form and output L multiplication triples. If the check does not hold, the parties output L default multiplication triples. The triple generation protocol is similar to that in the perfectly secure setting too. However, an instance of the triple generation protocol outputs L triples, making use of the fact that the triple sharing protocol outputs L triples. Similar to the perfectly secure MPC protocol, the cryptographically secure MPC protocol over hybrid networks has three phases, the triple generation phase, input phase, and circuit evaluation phase. However, in this case, the triple generation phase and the input phase need only one synchronous round. Since our verifiable secret sharing protocol terminates at the end of one round, the MPC protocol in this setting achieves input provision. Circuit evaluation proceeds similar to the perfectly secure setting. The cryptographically secure asynchronous MPC protocol is similar to the cryptographically secure MPC protocol over hybrid networks. Parties use the asynchronous broadcast and agreement on core set protocols to get around the lack of a synchronous broadcast channel. As expected, it is not possible to achieve input provision in this setting. 
one of our experiments involved inducing a random possibly large delay on the messages sent by some of the parties the aim was to verify if asynchronous mpc protocols run at the speed of the underlying network we call parties with such induced message delays as affected parties we found that there is negligible change in latency in both the lan and wan settings when a single party is affected since asynchronous protocols require communication from at most 3 parties at each step the latency increases as more number of parties are affected since the message delay of honest parties increases too in case of synchronous networks a single affected party would have the same latency as the case with 3 or 4 affected parties since the upper bound and message delay should be large enough to receive inputs of all honest parties some future directions to build upon our work is to construct a perfectly secure hybrid mpc protocol with two initial synchronous rounds tolerating one third corruptions for any number of parties since asynchronous networks are a better model for the real world bridging the gap between efficiency of synchronous and asynchronous protocols is also an important direction of research thank you